Halloween comes once every year. When it does, you should take full advantage of it. That means bringing as much terror, horror, fear, incredible trepidation as one can anywhere in the world. My name is Armand Orlock Dankworth Smythe. I have a sister named Avalon Lee. She's been a bit naughty lately. Let's see what we need to do about that. Oh, welcome to episode 8 of the Paranormal Rundown. Our guest tonight is Sylvia Schultz, celebrated author, paranormal investigator, and one of the smartest women you'll ever meet. Believe me, our dungeon has no chance of holding her. Stay tuned. Let's learn all that Sylvia knows, and let's see what happens to that naughty Avalon Lee. Hello, everybody out there in Paranormal Rundown land. This is Vic Hermanson, back with another hopefully exciting episode of the Paranormal Rundown. Tonight, we have a very important guest. We have Sylvia Schultz. Uh, she's an author of quite a few books. The book that I became familiar with, Sil with Sylvia through was 44 Years in Darkness, which was the story of Rhoda Derry. But Sylvia, you've got, what, 10, 15 other books out there? Uh, well, Gone on Vacation is the most recent one, and that is number nine. Number nine. Of the nonfiction books I've written. I've got uh, a cu couple of fiction books floating around out there, but <laughs> the, well, the nonfiction is the dearest to my heart. <laughs> she is generally reviewed as people will say things to her like she's the most convincing, uh, graceful, nonfiction paranormal writer there is. And that's what I found with um, 44 Years in Darkness. So, Sylvia, uh, is there anything you'd like to say before we get going? Oh, just that I'm delighted to be here and uh, really looking forward to a bunch of paranormal <laughs> dork chat. And, paranormal? Yeah. Hey, wait a minute, babe. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am enjoying geeking out over the paranormal uh, any time. I'm always Did up we for it. rename our podcast uh, just that That's what I was <laughs> <laughs> well i think we could certainly like put a subtitle or something in there there you go door chat <laughs> paranormal dork chat okay well right I'm now go it's top contender for the name of the episode that's <laughs> <laughs> well it'll definitely be the name of the episode but i was thinking about your podcast so okay i'm gonna start hitting the f9 and see what i come up with and sylvia Here's the here are the rules. There aren't any rules. Okay. If you <laughs> if if you if you hate all the topics, we'll go we'll do it again. If there's something that you want to talk about that doesn't come up, go ahead and talk about it. Uh, just it's as free form as you can possibly imagine. Okay. Okay, here we go. One, two, three, four, five. Oh, good. <clears throat> oh, these are good. Okay. The six topics tonight are, the six beginning topics are, Brain in a Vat Conjecture, Lovelock Cave, Sleeping Girls, Patricia McGuire, Hieroglyphic Helicopters, Planes, Submarines, uh, etc., Secret Technology, and the Codex Gigas. Hmm. Hmm. I think, I think those are some pretty good topics. Anybody have yeah, a? Yeah, that's a lot of interesting <laughs> stuff to cover there. I can do one or six. <laughs> 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 well, JJ, why don't you? Uh, since you can do one or I could do one, two. I could do six. So uh, why don't you go ahead and get started? Uh, sure. So correct me if I'm wrong, because I don't want to be knowledgeably wrong. The Codex of Vargas is a mysterious manuscript from the medieval times, it's which a, it's is a huge untranslated mm -hmm. because many people have tried to translate it and they cannot. It depicts a lot of 
fantastical plant life. And JJ, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but this is you're, you're going down the wrong path on this one. Okay. Uh, we're talking, that that sounds an awful lot like the Voynich manuscript. Yes, that's what I was thinking Correct. of. I'm you're sorry. thinking okay. about the Voynich, man, Voynich manuscript, which I think I've heard recently people saying they have translated it. No, it Ooh. still has it. They they have attempted yeah, to, but it, yeah, it still is untranslated. The Codex Gigas is uh, one of those things where a monk was trying to placate the devil <clears throat> or was oh, being punished one. by the okay. devil or something. And he was supposed to write this entire, I think it's a Bible, actually, uh, a Codex Gigas, because it's huge. Big, big thing. And there's a there's a painting in there of the devil that is always talked about and always shown. I'll just see if I can find it and I can share that screen. And he then proceeded to write this manuscript within one night. Like yeah, like one night, yeah. Mm. <clears throat> I'm not he, I'm not I'm not sure how come it's always supposed to be done in one night. <laughs> Well, yeah, he I wish I could he, accomplish stuff like that. <laughs> me too. Well, well, so like we'd be in like a hundred books by now, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, isn't the story behind the whole thing that he asked the devil for help? I mean, it, it kind of reminds me of that. Uh, oh, Josh, that scene from Tombstone where the guy sells his soul for the devil. Oh, Faust. Yeah. Faust, yeah, but mm. it, it kind of reminds me of that. I mean, he, he was writing it. And... Uh, from what I can, the only thing I remember about the whole thing is that he asked the devil for help, mm. uh, which kind of would be kind of like just, you know, selling your soul, help me get this done. And then he was able to accomplish it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not that desperate yet. <laughs> I uh, no, no, I I'm remember, not either. I can't remember exactly why he needed that help, but. Let's see if I can look it up. Yeah, I'm going to hang on a second. I'm looking at, for some reason, I'm having a, <clears throat> a hard time finding a good copy of that. But let me mm. see if I'm going to share my screen. Let me start screen one and share. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. And so that's the that's the drawing that they always show, which, you know, looks kind of like a devil to me. Mm. Uh, but the book itself, I think, is more than three feet tall. Uh. Yeah, it's massive. It looks almost Chinese or Japanese. It looks almost Asian, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. the way the artwork is. <clears throat> JJ yeah. would be the one to comment on that. Yeah. It definitely smacks of a lot of other medieval drawings and depictions. Yeah. But it oh, does have that kind of flair to it. it was the green face it. that reminded me of something <laughs> Asian. Well, in the tongue uh, or, or those flames... The scale pattern on the head is interesting. Well, he just got back from the uh, the scale dresser. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to hate that so bad, and yet I can't. <laughs> well, and you can tell obviously he just had his nails done. Right? Oh yeah, <laughs> look at those nice, long, crisp nails and a pedicure. Absolutely. Manicure. Pedicure. I just like the polka dot underwear he has on. <laughs> <laughs> he's a trendsetter. So, uh, so here's what here's what uh, the legend says on Wikipedia, Vic, if mm -hmm. you want to hear it. Yeah, let's hear it. All right. So according to one version of it recorded in the Middle Ages, uh, is a scribe monk broke his monastic vows and was sentenced to be walled up alive. Mm -hmm. And to escape death, he promised to create in one night a book to glorify the monastery forever, including all human knowledge. And oh. he near midnight, he became so desperate, he prayed to Lucifer to help him finish the book in exchange for his soul. So uh, the devil completed the master or the uh, manuscript and uh, the monk added the devil's picture as a tribute. So that's. You know, from the wise source of Wikipedia. Wikipedia is not bad. It's 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 clearly a good way to get a beginning bibliography. But so 
when they would wall you up, I'm assuming there would be a uh, a place where they would stick you and just brick you in and forget about you. Mm. Like an oubliette. Like an oubliette, yeah. And yeah. that and and you would just simply uh cease to exist in people's minds. Well, and I would assume since he completed the book that he didn't get walled up. So he didn't get, he didn't get walled up. <clears throat> unless the monks went back on their word. But so what would people have thought, JJ, or anybody, say in what does it say what year this was written, Dave? Uh no, let's see. I'll go up mm. and look. 16 well no no i don't, I don't have an exact year. all right we're, we're gonna say scanning we're gonna say 16, late 1600s okay late 1600s that's fine that's probably about as close as they can as they can date it but who would have been able to see this book i mean was, was this something that only other monks would ever read and what would they think as they were going through here <clears throat> and they saw this this drawing would this be something something they would find actually frightening would this be something they just found amusing what would or they instructive. think instructive what's that or instructive inst instructive what would they so, have thought back then there's a there's a few things <laughs> typically only monks of that monastery or if there happened to be any kind of visiting officials uh, would have access to any of their books so yes, only they would have this kind of information and have access to it. Mm -hmm. It's not uncommon to see various images of the devil or demons or hell within these types of books. However, if it was ever explicitly called out that this was in tribute of, I would think that would get you bricked up faster than anything else. <laughs> <laughs> or, or actually made by. Yes. <clears throat> now, it, I was wrong here. It actually said they I don't know why they referenced 1648 at the beginning. It says that it was is estimated to uh, be or rec records the codex in 2022. Hi, Dave. You're such an informational cutie. You're just so very adorable. The best estimates are that the Codex Gigas, which weighs 196 pounds, was finished in the year of our Lord, 1222. Its pages are composed of 310 leaves of the finest vellum, claimed to be made from the skins of 160 donkeys. Golly, that's an impressive quantity of donkeys. Avalon, this is your brother, Armand, Armand Orlock. It seems you're doing an excellent job of making sure that the information given forth is correct. Could you tell me, Avalon, where is our father? So yeah, well, much older. Well, yeah, what I'm seeing is between 1204 and 1230. Yep. But in the but in the 1600s, the uh, Emperor Rudolf II says he borrowed it and took it to his castle, and uh, he had no intention of ever returning. Yeah, I'm it. thinking when Emperor Rudolf yeah. borrows your books, you're not really thinking you're going to get the book back. <laughs> yeah, uh, but, you don't check his library card. <laughs> yeah. No, you know, you, in the you, library, you, please. Yeah, I don't but, think Emperor Rudolph is really obligated to give you back your book. Exactly, but it says the reason why he was his interest was so piqued because of the uh, devil's portrait in occultism that we're looking at. I wonder what the rest of the book has, because this is the only page I've ever seen from it. And if it <clears throat> if it had the entirety of human knowledge, even in 1220, that'd be quite a bit of stuff. Yeah, it says yeah. it has the uh, two Hebrew alphabets on the first page. Uh-huh. And then <clears throat> early Cyrillic and Glagolitic alphabets. No, uh, with that one. What is that one? Do you know what that is, JJ? No, I do not. And that already fails because there are many more variants of the Hebrew alphabet than two, oh, especially yeah. when you consider well, it. doesn't say it has script. the all of them. It just says it has two. 
I'm sorry. Well, I know, but if it has the entirety of human knowledge, then it would have more. Oh. Than <laughs> well, I'm guessing it would be a lot bigger too. Yeah, accurate. <laughs> Didn't wasn't it Pliny the Elder, or it was one of the Plinies who set his life goal at creating a book that had all of human knowledge in it? Yeah, it that was. was. That was Pliny the Elder. Yeah, that was, that was Pliny. Pl- Pliny. 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 Okay. Yeah. And oh. um, yeah, it was his his nephew. Pliny's <clears throat> nephew that um, was president of the, at the eruption of Vesuvius mm-hmm. in August 79. And that's where Pliny the Elder died. And uh, yeah, he, he I don't think he ever finished that huge encyclopedia that he was working on. But yeah, it was the Elder Pliny that was working on that project. Well, when, when the Elder Pliny died, did the younger Pliny take over the work? No, um, Pliny the Younger was mostly concerned with recording the history that was around him. Okay. Um, he wasn't really, he had learned a lot of science and inquisitiveness from his uncle, but I, he didn't, he didn't take up that mantle of, of finishing that huge project that his uncle was working on. So anyway, have you ever seen a book like this? Any of you? Can't see what I have. I've Just... seen quite a few. Well, tell us about one. Well, there's a the in medieval times you have a, this is when there were an absolute plethora of grimoires. And although the vast majority of them were Faith based, meaning that um, a wannabe magician had to ritually purify him or herself for 24, 48, 72 hours ahead of time, and then they would be able to do things. But yet, you also had a lot of grimoires dedicated to the devil as well, whether they named entities. And that's actually where, like, the vast majority of our knowledge of, well, not knowledge, our fake knowledge of the demonic comes from. It was just all of these random sources that were pulling names out of their butt and slapping them down. <laughs> and then mm-hmm. people begin, oh, this is old. It has to be true. It's just like old tradition. So, so. so that's interesting, J.J. So what you're saying is... uh a lot of these these grimoires that had uh, references to demons in them, they were doing that to sort of get street cred so they could have people look at their grimoire. They were just Pretty making much. the de- demonic stuff up. Yeah, because, I mean, if you can start to name high powers in hell, then that instantly gives your work a heck of a lot more credit. You know, I, I but, you know, whether it is... Bel Felgor or any of the other host of things that are not biblically derived, that's that's usually where they came from. Well, I mean the 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 biblical reference to demons is really small in terms of named Oh well demons, in ter- right? for the Hebrew Bible there is one named demon. And that is a Sha'ir, which isn't even a demon. It's it's a goat thing, like a like a, a satyr or a pan. Um, yeah, you get more in the Christian New Testament, but that's really about it. Now there are allusions to entities that we think of now as demons, whether that be Lilith, as um, Az- Azazel, etc. But those weren't, depending upon the time period that you were in, those were anything from forces of nature to, you know, uh, um, borrowed Akkadian deities, et cetera. Hmm. So I was going through Scribd one night and found this book, something like a Dictionary of Demons. And it was a huge thing. And every entry was something like, you know, Mel Shegaloth. You know, uh, commander of 320 demonic, mm-hmm. you know, 320 demonic hordes uh, responsible for uh, all, you know, hurricanes, this kind of thing. So reading that, I was just thinking, 
this was their version of Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> well, that's a good way of putting it. <laughs> Interesting way of looking at it. You know, I mean, they were just making this garbage up whole, cl- you know, out of nothing. Well, what? you also had this idea of, you know, as above, so below. Right. And you had these nine ranks of angels, and therefore there must be nine negative ranks of the infernal. And then people just started flushing them out. Like, for example, there is supposed to be seven archangels. Mm-hmm. We there are consistently four that are named, and the others are just made up depending upon which book you happen to be reading. So, all right. So the archangels we know are Michael. No, we know four of them. Three we of them. Four. That's it. Okay, but th- let, I want to go through those because listeners may not know those. That's Michael. Oh, sure. Gabriel or Gabriel, uh-huh. mighty warrior of God. Mm-hmm. Uh, Raphael, the healing power of mm-hmm. God. Uriel, the light of God. And Mikael, who is like God. Who is like God. That one's always interested me in that, I mean, Many parts of the Bible say no, nothing is like God. So why was Michael referred to in that manner? He was referred to in that manner because of the holiness of his statue. And uh, going back to what J.J. said earlier, also about what is below, also above, or as above, also below, mm-hmm. he, uh, he he mentioned that you really didn't get into names per se of uh specific demons until after the uh, new testament writings uh but the bible uh the holy scriptures it refers to things like uh powers principalities and rulers and mm-hmm. darknesses and see each one of those is a different order uh you know when 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 lucifer fell he fell because of pride and was going to try to make everything like God. But once you start getting into the church fathers, uh, that's when you can uh, get more into the, uh, the, I'm going, I hate to use the term, but the ranking or the authority of hell. Okay. And uh, so, I mean, it's there. I mean, you just have to be careful what you read and all the, so all the different writings like this in the, especially in the medieval ages came out to contradict what the Holy scriptures or the Holy writings were of the Christianity quote unquote world. So that's where we get a lot of stuff in this. I just hate they made Satan look like some kind of clown in that picture, though. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, we were talking about grimoires before, and I was trying to find this. I one of the the books that wrote back in the day was called Hunting Demons, and there was a lot of stuff about demonic in there. And I, I was looking through it, I couldn't find it. I, there was a pope back in the medieval time that I, I don't remember which pope this was. Uh, Athanasius or Innocent the Six or something, but he actually wrote his own grimoire and distributed it to his priests. And the <laughs> reason he did that was because he figured that if his priests, if his clergy were knowledgeable enough to be able to summon a demon and then cast it back into hell where it belonged, they would would be better prepared to do exorcisms when they encountered a parishioner of theirs that needed mm. to have an exorcism performed. So, yeah, this the, there was a pope of the Catholic Church that wrote his own gr- grimoire on purpose, teaching his priests how to summon demons. Which, wow. which pope was it? Like a you, practice you, manual was, or something. Um, pope Honorius. Honorius, that's right. Pope yes, Honorius. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Now, the Father Bird song, was that part of your exorcist training to summon the demon before you cast it out? Oh, no. <laughs> I'll just check it. That idea is not an uncommon one. You've The idea of being able to harness demonic power 
is fine found from Aramaic water bowls, but is really living the most strongly in the class in the Ethiopic Orthodox Church, where you have this class of priests called Debtera that will capture a demon's essence uh, by trapping them within um, either seals of Solomon or other iconography or just words. And then that power is burned up in order to fuel God's will. Okay, so that is cool. The depth I was the- raised in the Orthodox Church, but we never really talked about demons and the demonic. And that that is fascinating to me that to to hear something about the the culture in which I was raised and hear something new about it. That's neat. Thank you. Well, the the, or, the Ethiopic Orthodox Church is 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 more akin to um, the Coptic Orthodox Church mm. in that they did not even though they borrow a lot of greek terms in terms of the clergy they are not logic based they believe that christ was in addition to being a messiah was also the greatest magician that ever lived and it has a very magical base to it that persists to this day it's fascinating it really is oh wow well can we talk about that a minute i mean magician to me in my modern 21st century mind indicates someone who knows how to create convincing illusions is that what they were looking at jesus as or was the, were they looking at as someone who could oh no actually had, manipulate magic he had true power true power like, there's this famous tale in the keber nagesh the glory of the kings mm-hmm. where christ is walking along the sea of galilee with his 12 disciples and the demon nardada nadara yeah she springs forth from the center of the sea and then shoots a column of flame 384 cubits into the air. And then Christ looks at her, utters a magical word, Mm -hmm. and waves his hand. And she is therefore banished back into the chaos of the waters. Mm. That's a cool story. Yeah, that uh, part also is i mean i don't know how factual it really is but i've always heard that 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 story was to fulfill what was written in the book of job about when god is questioning job and said job can you draw the leviathan from the deep Uh and so when you see this it is being fulfilled in christ where the leviathan so to speak rises up and starts spitting out fire and christ puts you back in her place nice but i mean that's i i mean i can't prove that what it means of course well, well uh, why not <laughs> I, come on I'm very disappointed no, that's a really good theory that's pretty cool. you, you got all the way through seminary and you can't prove these uh hey, I, man. <laughs> in 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 31 years of ministry i've learned one thing is I don't know a thing. <laughs> so there we go. Yeah. Amen. I have 31 years of ministry, but now I've pretty much learned the same thing. Well, <laughs> do you think we should do another spin? Hey, let's roll the dice. All right, let's roll them. All Dave, right. can we add to the list to, uh, to talk about the brain in the jar theory some, some other time? Absolutely. Oh, brain in a vat. That's, that was one of my favorites, actually. <laughs> I love that one. Brain in a vat conjecture. Okay. It is on the roundup list. It's on the roundup list. Sylvia, we do another thing. Every time we do this, there are certain topics that we just don't get to. Okay. And so about, you know, once every six weeks or so, we do the paranormal rundown roundup. Where we're going back through and we are hitting those topics that we missed before. So it's... uh, Absolutely. uh, (laughs) Round two of Dork Talk. Dork Talk. I like that. We're going to keep that. We're going to keep that. There has a subtitle. (laughs) Okay. Here we go. The six topics today are, this time, are the Patterson-Gimlin film, plus other Bigfoot video and photos in film. Uh, Number two is the priming effect. 
and other psychological aspects of the paranormal. Number three is A Wrinkle in Time and the Tesseract by Madeline Langle. Number four is Medical Quackery of All Kinds. Number five is Neo-Feudalism. And number six is Accidental Psychic Events. And then I have a note that says, ask Victor. Um, (laughs) I'm not sure why I put that there. (laughs) Accidental psychic events? Accidental what now? Accidental psychic events. What was the second one, Victor? Hmm. The priming effect and other psychological aspects of the paranormal. So psychological aspects of the paranormal. Yeah. And by the way, Sylvia, we take what we want out of these. Exactly. (laughs) That's so fine. it doesn't Jerry have to stay exactly on the me. topic. So it's like, eh, let's talk about that instead. That's cool. What about the, uh, so what were you thinking when you wrote that one down, Victor? So what's the priming effect? Let's talk about well, the priming. Oh, I bet I know what you're talking about. Let me guess. Yeah, go ahead. Is this where you are talking about somebody plants an idea and therefore you pick up on it and then it starts happening or? Well, That's you, you and I. Like to me. You and I have listened to, I don't know, 100 EVPs together. Yes. Okay. I play an EVP for you and say, hey, Dave, what do you hear here? And you'll listen. You'll say, "Ah, it says Henry. And in my mind, it says Pope Francis. I mean, you can really get pretty different. You can get way off. You can get way off in these things. But if I say to you, hey, I'm going to play you an EVP that says, please get out of my room. It's very hard for you to hear anything other than please get out of my room. Mm -hmm. Got it. Well, one thing is we got to understand is, uh, you know, folks like JJ and myself, we're good old Southern boys. Mm -hmm. And so so when you say the priming (laughs) effect, we're thinking about pouring water down a pipe and priming a well. (laughs) (laughs) Fair enough. Yeah. Or pouring some gasoline in a carburetor and trying to get the (laughs) sucking out of a hose. There you go. (laughs) Transfer. That's what you do. um, Or just try. You ever have those uh, old lawnmowers in which had the push button primers on oh, it oh yeah, yeah. Outlines yeah. lines like that <laughs> yeah i had that for years and years i just years. remember my grandfather sucking it out of the hose to get it to transfer it uh from the car <laughs> to the lawnmower <laughs> that's <laughs> it he needed some more gas <laughs> but i uh, i uh, do think that uh that that vic is on the right page here if he says i'm going to play you this little clip and this is what i'm hearing Okay, so it's going to be very hard for anybody else to hear anything but that, just like you said. But to put it in 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 real terms, uh, well, David, I'll go back to uh, quote unquote Paula, and uh, 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 this person believes or has such a priming effect in her life right now that she feels that she cannot be freed from the supernatural so therefore mm-hmm. she's not mm-hmm. so that when, when, when that priming effect or that thought or that idea when, when it when it starts going through the the human mind and that's the only thing that you think of uh, you're it's basically hard to get around helpless. it, it Don't it's think hard, it's hard to get around it yeah but now, Sylvia, I, so I listened to the, the Road to Dairy episode with Trailer Trash Tears. Really, really enjoyed awesome. that. It, it sounded, you're welcome. It sounded to me like you do a lot of investigating at that facility. I um, do, yes. So when you hear EVPs from there uh, and, and y'all are passing it around, what do you think of this effect? Because I could, I've investigated a bunch of different sites, and I can tell you that having a docent or one of the regulars there walk you around and say, oh, this is where we often get Mary on our EVPs. And all of a sudden, <laughs> you're getting Mary on your EVPs. Mm. And these things propagate over time and build like real legends out of oh, something absolutely. that if you got to the original, you would go, yeah, that's not what that says. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Have you experienced stuff like that there? Uh, well, yes, I have. Um, I'm friends with a, a renowned ghost hunter up in the Chicago area named Dale Kazmarek. And um, he, I was visiting him a, a 
several months ago and he had he was playing some evps for me that he had collected and what i like to do when listening to evps is i like to listen to it over and over again and close my eyes so i don't have i have as little distraction as possible Mm -hmm. um there are some evps that i've listened to that are just clear as a bell you can't possibly mistake it for anything else but one of the the EVPs that Dale played for me was they thought that they heard a woman saying a name like um, Edith or something like that. And I clearly heard Esther. It was Mm -hmm. something like that. It was it was Mm -hmm. different enough that I said, well, you know, I really don't think that's what it says. I think it says thus and so. And then Dale listened to it again and he was like, oh, you know what? I think you're right. So there's, I love it when you get EVPs that are just pristine and beautiful and you can tell exactly what they're saying. But most of the voices we get are open to interpretation and um, we we just do the best we can with the, the input that we have. And, uh, yeah, some people have different opinions as to what's being said. Just to let you know, um, we've had a string of EVPs showing up on our recordings lately. Oh, yeah? When Just when we were recording the rundown. Um, and by we, he means Vic. He means, yes, by we, I mean me. <laughs> <laughs> what are them? <laughs> the royal we. <laughs> I said one of them was on this show, but... Uh, Several others were on other, uh, I think, Trailer Trash Terror episodes. Neat. Somebody's I was, yeah. chiming in. I was recording in a closet. In, uh... <laughs> well, thank God you hey, came out of the closet. Hey, there's no shit in there. <laughs> <laughs> on acoustics in there. Fenwick Island, uh, Delaware, Okay, where my wife's family gathers to have this big family shindig every two years. You know, we rent houses down there. You know, it's we cook, we go to the beach. It's a great time. But I really I was really trying to get this one podcast out that I had been working on for a long time. And so when we weren't doing anything, I just put myself in this closet with all these acoustically absorbent things around me and recorded this 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 podcast, which was I guess you'd call it flash fiction in that I would think about what I wanted the next part of the story to be and then record that until I was happy with that and then stop and think again, <clears throat> worked out pretty well, but the, I was listening back to one of these and I genuinely hear, and look, this is a closet that was pretty much at the very edge of the house. There was no plumbing around it. There was no body else in the house at the time. And the, the EVP is something along the lines of, <clears throat> And it goes on for a long time. It, hmm. You know, Dave, you you remember hearing this. Yeah, it sounded to me almost <laughs> like you were taking speech on a record and, slowing and playing it, it backwards slowly. Mm-hmm. It was really, really, you know, that you couldn't understand anything out of it, but it was clearly this this speech. It was, and you it could, was a voice of some kind. You could hear words, but you couldn't make any of them out. Any of them out. But you've had clear ones too, yeah, right? And, you had something pair at you and say yes. Right. I've had I've had just when I'm sitting here recording like this, I've had one say and I had just said yes, hadn't I? Yeah, you had said yes and you were describing why you said yes right. to an answer and something and and then yeah. the last one was something like and it was a, it was one of those super clear ones. It was uh-huh and so, <laughs> so what uh, you could actually, I mean, well, I th- I think you just said the whole answer for the question or, or the topic. Uh, you went into this closet, so to speak, and was and was doing your, your show. Mm-hmm. OK, so one could actually say that you set the tone, you set the place, you set the atmosphere, you set the environment around you. Mm-hmm. for this and so therefore when you got going there was no other interruption or nothing else contributing to your time at that moment except for what you were doing whatever was so, in my mind so so mm-hmm. you you primed that effect 
to either I'm not saying it's just something you heard in your head or you set a time for something supernatural to take place that was with you. Regardless of the point, the pump was primed. As we well, for, for the, the record, Father Birdsong, the, the <laughs> episode he did was on the Antichrist. <laughs> oh, oh there we go. <laughs> All right, well, that, that pretty much sets it up then. Well, we had done, we had, I don't, I don't want to focus on trailer trash terrors, but we had done two episodes about the Antichrist, mm -hmm. one about 40 minutes and one about three and a half hours. Three and a half hours. Yeah. Yeah. One about mm. Three and a half hours. And so the third part was, I had this idea that, okay, what if you had Antichrist test runs? Okay. Where it's not focused on the entire world. We're just going to choose a little town in Louisiana and we're going to have a local apocalypse. And hmm. we'll get a we'll get an antichrist who comes out of that, and we'll get two witnesses, and we'll get all of that. And at the end, the antichrist will lose, and the town will more or less go back to normal. Um, and and so the, I think the name of the story is Charlie Monroe, Antichrist and re Transmission Repairman, or something like that. Uh, <laughs> So Ch Charlie's okay. anyway, <laughs> but I think you're right, Father Birdsong. I mean. After I heard that, I, I couldn't record anything else without mm -hmm. wondering. I wasn't comfortable anymore. Mm. Well, I think you do. So so that's almost like priming the environment for activity. Exactly. And, and Sylvie, I'm sure you've seen this with groups coming through that site. If you get somebody in a group who all of a sudden thinks there's something really negative there, the oh. entire energy of the room, Changes. the whole everybody starts getting a little, you know, skittish and and negative stuff will start happening. You'll start getting, you know, growly type EVPs or responses on a shack hack or whatever. Yep. It really just the intention of someone there or the fear of someone there, especially if you have like teenagers. I hate it when people bring <laughs> teenagers catching. on these things. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but but it can go really negative really quick. Well, that that goes back to what we were talking about in several shows back uh, uh, about opening those doors. Mm -hmm. And JJ can testify to this too. If you if you set yourself in that type of environment and you open the door, something's going to walk through, whether it be positive or negative. Something is coming. And so when we start, I mean, that that's why I like that each and every one of you guys are not novices because the supernatural is not anything to play around with. And so when that environment is set, and let's just say a bunch of teenagers are wanting to play with the Ouija board, yeah. they have primed that pump, buddy, and something's coming. And you may not like what's coming sometimes. Do you all ever <clears throat> have people use those at the site, Sylvia? No, thank you. Yeah. No. Is it is it I, not, I don't is it not allowed? That. It, it's it's not that it's not allowed. We have never expressly forbidden it. The only thing we expressly forbid is um, people trying to cross spirits over, because the the spirits at the Peoria State Hospital are there because they want to be because that was a place where they found safety mm -hmm. and comfort and and help. So, yeah, we're like, no, don't do not tell them to leave. <laughs> They're here because <laughs> they want to be. Um, but no, I, I've we've just never really had that type of crowd at um, the uh, kind of crowd that would use a Ouija board. The only let's see, the only place I've actually seen a Ouija board being used was at the um, the Roth house in um oh what's that town in illinois um watsika mm -hmm. illinois they have a ouija board there in the roth house that it's very interesting that they have one there because the roth house historically was used by a family it was owned and lived in by a family that was very into spiritualism mm -hmm. um Reader's Digest condensed version, thumbnail version of this. Um, Mary Roth passed away when she was a teenager. And then 
her spirit inhabited the body of a girl named Laurency Venom. And it is the best known case of um, spiritual possession, ghostly mm-hmm. possession in mm-hmm. American history. Is- um, and Laurency Venom actually came to live with the Roths because she was exhibiting the personality and the knowledge of Mary Roth. So she was allowed to go and live with the Roths Mm -hmm. for, for quite some time. But anyway, that the Roth house is still standing and you can investigate there. It's actually a delightful little bed and breakfast, but yes, they have a, a Ouija board there that people were using. And I just stood and watched. I was not, I was not going to partake in that, but uh, we did a very interesting experiment experiment at the Roth house, seeing as how it had been a place where spiritualism was performed, I suggested that we try some table tipping. Oh, and it worked. <clears throat> it was awesome. No All right. You got, you, you, <laughs> I've never so heard good. anybody talk about table tipping before. Please, Sylvia, give us the whole story. Okay. So the Victorians were very into t- table tipping. Mm-hmm. What they would do is they would get a usually a round table, um, something very light, like a little end table sort of thing, and people would sit around it, and you just place your hands on the table, just your fingertips touching, and you ask the spirits to move the table. The first experience I had with this was at the Lizzie Borden house, and the table actually flipped over. It was amazing. Yeah, we I got to see that. <laughs> we okay, didn't now, have that at the Roth house. I kind of led people through it. I, I, I explained, this is how you do it, and this is what we're going to say, and this is what th- we're hoping for. Um, and people had just their fingertips on it, and we felt the table kind of vibrating. It never actually tipped, but we did feel it vibrating under our fingers, and that was... Mm. Just amazing. Well, did it? Did any of the legs come up off the floor? No. But the one that, but the one that turned over, all four legs came oh, off the oh, floor. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It it went completely onto its side. Did it hit anybody in the head or anything when it tipped over? No, no. It just kind of moved up under our fingers, and it we we let go of it, and it fell to the floor. So just like a slow motion. Yeah. Lifting yeah. and over. Yeah, it oh. was just. Whoo, so that's amazing. So when yeah. you when you have someone who's fundamentally skeptical and something like that, what are they saying is causing that? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see. <laughs> Not being a skeptic myself, I don't know how you would <laughs> well, try. I, I, and, I, I, and I thought maybe you just had somebody who, who happened to come along who was, and I and I'll use that word fundamentally skeptical. The, you know, because they yeah. really do not want to even entertain the possibility of anything other than just raw physical causality being at play. I know a couple of diehard skeptics, my sister and my husband. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, yeah, we we were talking, uh, Reverend Birdsong said something about uh, inviting things in. My sister does not understand why I do what I do. She said, it's it's just like playing ding dong ditch. (laughs) And uh, (laughs) sorry. Picture. I, I didn't realize you were taking a drink just then. I would have said that. <laughs> I'm all yes, right. that's how my sister puts it. Um, Except in ding yeah, dong ditch, they don't ding just, back. There you go. <laughs> right. My, my husband just absolutely has nothing to say about any of this. But yeah, I, I wonder what they would say about something that happened like that, that that a, a table just turns over when people only have their fingertips on it. Well, that would be what I say. Y'all are dig dogs and I'm ditching out. <laughs> <laughs> well, nice one. <laughs> I think one of, the, one of the interesting things about all that is whenever you hear about Victorian spiritual practices nowadays, it's always done under the guise of 
it was all an attempt to make money. It was all a sham. They did some elaborate pranks, and that's true. They absolutely did. But yeah. I think that also ignores the fact that, you know, there were people not in it for the money. They were not all charlatans oh, that did all this. Right. Now, there I were wanna... people that were really seeking answers. And mm. yeah. Exactly. Now, but when this topic first came up, I was, I think there's two different aspects and we've covered both of them. The first was I was thinking of priming more in terms of bias confirmation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then it could also be, as Father Birdsong was saying, that you are, if you have an environment prepped, then it's very likely that's going to be the result of it. And I think the ultimate case for both of these, have y'all heard of the Philip experiment? I have. It's one of the yes. topics. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes, that I one am. is just, it's fascinating. Well, talk I, about it, JJ. Yeah, talk about it. All right. So yeah. Philip experiment, 1972. There is a paranormal research going on involving thought forms or tulpas, tulpas. <laughs> and these people began they invented an entire spiritual person named philip they gave him a backstory uh, mm -hmm. they thought about him they would converse with him and sure enough really weird stuff began to happen during this entire experiment and, you know, a lot of people will say, oh, well, you know, you've just pri you've either primed the environment or you expected something to happen. And so it did. And that's just confirmation bias in its purest form. But I think that kind of skirts around some of the more interesting possibilities of it. It's a really fascinating experiment. I find the idea of tulpas being possible just terrifying. Because with all the stuff that's out on the Internet today and all the things you could think into existence, a lot of them would not be fun. Well, I think the Philip experiment really proved things. I mean, this is exactly what they were trying to do. They were trying to create a, a tulpa and they put all their energy into it and then they started getting results. So, yeah, I, I'm like, what did you think was going to happen? That's what you were <laughs> That's what you were working towards. Yeah, this, this was your goal, and you accomplished yeah. your goal. What, <laughs> Sylvia, do you know how that experiment ended? Do you know what they finally did? I, I am not exactly sure. The, all the literature kind of ends there that they that they created this 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 they called this like Lord Philip or whatever into being this this medieval fellow into being, and then they they just kind of the literature kind of trails off after that. And well, then, of course, you have the Slender Man. Yes, mm -hmm. we do have Slender Man. Or Black-Eyed Children. Oh, oh yeah. I, I have never run books. across a Black-Eyed Child or black a pack of Black-Eyed Children. Have you run across Slender Man? usually run in pairs. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I've never, so, never run across one. There are so many, many horrible YouTube spoofs about... People claiming that, oh, I, you know, I bought my house and I can't move out, but now I've got bats everywhere, and uh, it's just awful, absolutely well, awful. Well, I think I think Sylvie hit on a very good point too, and it, and it just goes to confirm uh, the whole conversation. Uh, she said that, you know, during the Philip experiment, they sat down and called. Well, from my background, I think you got to be careful what you're calling, huh. you know, because you don't you don't know whether you're, what you're calling is. I mean, I'm one of those skeptics. It would be I would be really pressed hard to believe that it is the spirit of a certain person. I mean, I, I'm of the frame of mind. If you're calling forth a spirit, there couldn't be very much good out of it. Um, uh, that's just from my experience. Uh, but, uh, I, I think she hit the nail on the head, as we say, that, uh, that if you, they, they sat there and wanted to call this presence forward and they got what they wanted. I mean, case in point. Yeah. Well, I think the way that they were publishing this work was that Philip was 
a totally fictional entity right. that had never um, existed, never lived. And of right. It was not a historical person right. at all. It was somebody they made up for the experiment. They made up for the experiment. And of course, okay. when you think about it, uh, spirits can lie. True. So <clears throat> it could be certainly a. There's that wrinkle, too. You know, a case of yeah. identity theft of, yes, you. <laughs> yeah. They're in the can't escape it. Well, I, I think that's, you know, the. The point that <laughs> Father Birdsong is is making and going down this path, I hadn't really thought about because I've I've heard of that experiment as well, and here you are, you know, saying you're 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 trying to put this thing into existence, and then you start asking it questions, and they didn't get responses right away. <clears throat> um, it no, took it several sessions before they started getting right. results. So you're putting out there what you want. Uh, there's absolutely no reason something demonic couldn't come in and start mimicking what of they course. intended exactly. to create. You, you've given exactly. the demon the really entire script. That. Yeah, you know, I haven't right. either, and that's that's disturbing. Is just like a Ouija board. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Huh. Or the if you look at the method. Philip experiment in a whole different light. What's that, JJ? Or what? the Estes method, Estes. which I I view as as being as dangerous, if perhaps not more so than what a Ouija board is. Really, depending Why on the way that? it's done. So, it, yeah, it, it yeah, does, you're, you're absolutely right, David. It does depend upon how it's done. Um, the what is it? The, so I've the Estes method is a way oh. where you're divorcing one person from the situation so that they can then relay answers from a spirit. It's kind of like a double blind test. However, you know, if it's done in a safe manner, it's, I don't think there's too much of a risk involved, but there are some people that will purposefully invoke a spirit and want it to possess them. And that's the version, which is just, I, I couldn't believe uh, when I heard people actually attempting to do this in a straight manner. It was kind mm. of horrifying. So That's Kelly. very horrifying. Sylvia, have oh, you I ever am. seen people doing the Estes method? Oh, I've used the Estes method. Oh, please tell us oh, about really? that. Yeah, please. <laughs> please, please, please. Well, no, no. The, the Estes method with which I am familiar involves um, – one person sitting there with noise canceling headphones or the headphones in which the spirit box is playing through and mm -hmm. a blindfold. Mm -hmm. And you, the, the other people in the room ask questions and the person who is blindfolded just says whatever it is that the spirit box says. They, they just they report what the spirit box blurts out. So, so the, the method is using electronics. It's not just, a psychic impression in their mind or anything. Right. Okay. Right. I'm sorry, guys, but the only thing I can think of right now with y'all telling this story is Whoopi is Patrick Swayze jumping in Whoopi Goldberg. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I really need to see that movie someday. That's never, the Swayze method. You, you never, you've never seen the movie. Oh, oh, okay. I got you. Okay. Wrong method. Wrong method. Okay. <laughs> but I yeah, I, I did this. I was, uh, just real quick, uh, to be clear, what I was saying, the method that Sylvia described, that is the safe and I think canonical method. But there are much more dangerous variants out there that scare me. But, oh. yeah. Okay, yeah, so I have heard of people using white noise instead mm -hmm. of like a, uh, a spirit box or, you know, some type of radio frequency sweep. Um, and. Even then, you're not necessarily asking for something to possess you. You're looking for psychic impressions, I think, would be what you would call it, mm -hmm. uh, which is getting closer to what J.J. is talking about. But I've not heard of anybody wanting to, like, become – well, I guess, you know, if you had a medium, if you if you, if if someone was a medium and you put them in noise-canceling headphones – and you were asking the questions, they were giving the responses. That's that would be the same thing almost as what you're talking about. So, JJ, I guess you're talking about the danger being that whoever is stuck in the sensory deprivation state uh, saying, please come within me and possess me rather than just give me answers. Exactly. 
Bad idea. That's just foolish. Well, they, in fact, yeah, one, of, <laughs> one of our common acquaintances kind of put themselves into that same exact position, and it was didn't have the heart to Not say good. it. But I'm like, you're a, a much scared me to death when I heard that stuff. Yeah, I, I mean, it, I just remember the moment, and I'm going, oh no, that's <laughs> yeah. It was how do you get yourself thing. back? That's what I'm saying. I mean, mm. how how can you? You have got when, when when you do something like that, you have you have given part of yourself away, and I don't think there's a way to get it back. Yeah, that ain't well. Cool. I, I would assume you would have to be exercised. Exactly. Good. That's about what it that's, would take. That's about it. Think. You would have to have someone pull you out. Yeah, you're right. Can I tell you the moment that I've started to think? of these topics seriously mm. go ahead um i was in <clears throat> i used to be i used to be in mensa <clears throat> i'd pay my dues to be in mensa and mensa is not very much fun <laughs> 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 you got a lot of people there who are really impressed with themselves <laughs> i should I, think so <laughs> i so i decided after a while yeah i can find something better to do so i was going to a Mensa party and it was pretty well attended. And I was going with a friend of mine named Al Gage. Al is still the most intelligent person I've ever known. He's a guy who dropped out of school in ninth grade and just essentially taught himself to be an aerospace engineer. Hmm. And, and he really did teach himself to be an aerospace engineer. Uh, so we go to the party and there are these kids and I'm thinking they must've been about eight or nine. And they're playing with the Ouija board. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> they weren't my kids. <laughs> <laughs> they weren't my kids. And, but they're over there. And I can hear these kids saying things like, like, you know, look, it's working. It's working. It's working. It's working. And they were genuinely talking to something. They were genuinely interacting with something. And let me, let me tell you why I, I'm certain of that. First off, when Gage came into the room, the board spelled out something along the lines of disgusting, nauseating person. This is coming from eight-year-olds. Disgusting, nauseating person. And hmm. <clears throat> and I and so they said, well, who? You know, tall, fat, bald. <laughs> 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 which was pretty much a, a perfect uh, description of Gage, tall, fat, bald. Um, and so Gage goes over there and says, and starts asking questions of this thing. You know, hey guys, you know, who are you talking to? Uh, we don't know their, their name, but well, where is he? And the, the, the board says circling Jupiter. Eight year olds. OK, and then the point where I just said, look, this is something that should not be happening. Gage was, you know, incredibly brilliant. And he says, OK, what is the universe? Eight year olds, love and indifference. Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Which, which was the point that I went to the parents and said, Hey, listen, your kids are over there doing something that I think <laughs> might stop to definitely <laughs> be harmful to them. You know, she says, oh, there's playing a game. No, 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 no. Let me tell you what, you know, is your eight year old child capable of saying something like love and indifference in response to a question of what is the universe? Mm, huh. No, I'm going to go. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's time to go. <laughs> wow. So when I saw that. Suddenly. I became aware that there were things in the world that I just simply didn't understand at all. Mm. Mm. I'm sorry. I shut everybody up. And then he joined no, a group no, called I'm the Paranormal I'm just suggesting Dorks. that. How, how cool and creepy that is at the same time. Oh, it, was, it, was, very, it was very creepy. And, and, you know, I wasn't a father at that time. I didn't have kids. But my fatherly instinct kicked in. You know, no, I can get rock that. So <laughs> what, yeah. Did you hear what she said, guys? 
I did. <laughs> <laughs> well, w- w- one of one of the things that bothers me about 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 your story is that you said the the parents kind of shrugged it off. Oh, they did. And 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 going back once again, uh, it's funny to me that we keep going back to this point. But but it's kind of like the, in these days, and, and Sylvia, I don't know if you've seen one, but I showed the guys a while back that uh, going back to Ouija boards that they've even created a spirit board that that has a picture of Jesus on it, and it's supposed to be a Christian uh, Ouija board. I, Wait, I, 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 oh, Josh, sit on the yeah. picture on Discord, and uh, but but see see mm. parents buy that garbage, and once more. You open a door that you don't want to walk through. Uh-uh. Well, I have seen pictures of a My Little Pony Ouija board. It's all pink and stuff. Oh, my really? God. That's insane. I'm not oh. even making this up. I am not making this up. I, I do a talk on hunting demons on, on the book. And, um, yeah, I, I I mentioned Ouija boards in my talk, and I went online to find pictures of Ouija boards. And, yes, I found a My Little Pony. My Little board. Pony. Why don't they just have My Little Pony cigarettes or, you know, <laughs> True, it's about as harmful. You know, or, my, uh, or my Little Pony whiskey. Um, there you go. At least make some good out of it. I mean, my little shot glasses. There you go. Mm. My Little Pony whiskey and shot glasses. That <laughs> I I can't believe there's a my look. I know you're telling me the truth, but it's astounding to me. <laughs> it's astounding to me that there is a My Little Pony Ouija board. Yeah. This well, that's better than some of the other things that I believe inhabit the internet about My Little Pony, and <laughs> oh, well, I'm going to leave it at that. I don't. I don't know if we want to go down that road. <laughs> we do not. I promise you. You're, you're talking about bronies. Is that what you're talking about? <laughs> uh, I don't know if we need to go of, there. This is a family yeah. show, man. Time to roll the dice, Vic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But, but going back to what David said 20 minutes ago or something, um, you mentioned uh, your grandfather uh, siphoning the gas by mouth. <laughs> yeah. That reminded me, I have just put together a talk on marvels and wonders and oddities, and I gave it for the first time last night at a library. One of the things I mentioned is fire eating, and I found the story of a Romanian fire eater named Vlad Hadescu, something like that. So it's a standard one of those um, Romanian he, names. But, but yeah. Yeah. Um, he, an he Escu was, name. He was performing, or Kadaku, or something like that. His first name was Vlad. I remember that. Um, he was performing in Budapest on January 23rd, 1998, and he was doing his fire eating show, and he took a, a sip of his, or a mouthful of his fire breathing liquid, a high test alcohol or something, and he accidentally swallowed a little bit. And then he burped. Oh. And so he had fire in his the, lungs or fire in his fire, esophagus. Yeah, the fire went down into his stomach and he exploded. Bad day. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what? Well, well, he, he what? Exploded. He exploded. He exploded. Yes, he he he's accidentally swallowed some of the liquid. Mm-hmm. No, you don't mean like boom. Burped. You mean and the, exploded. The, the burp uh, <laughs> lit the flame, or the, the 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 burp met the flame coming out. And and so it went all the way down to his stomach. To yeah, the burp. That's horrible. Oh. Mm. Well, I guess you would call that an occupational hazard. There you but... go. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, yeah. I I can remember. I'm going to go back to the kids with the Ouija board. Uh, I, I I was watching. Look, the only thing that was worse that night than watching the kids was everybody telling myself and Al Gage, I mean, who literally was probably walking around with an IQ of 180. Uh, you know, I mean, there are people who just aren't measurable in terms of how intelligent they are. And he was one of those guys. But he had mm-hmm. seen what I saw, and he was certainly not going to uh, deny what he saw. But we were trying to explain to the parents. We were trying to explain to other people there. And, man, we were just absolutely dismissed, treated but as a total, total mm-hmm. idiots. 
And I, and I can remember thinking, look, you've known me for a couple of years. You've known Gage for 10 years. Have you ever thought of us as idiots before? You know, why are you thinking of us as idiots? Of us, <laughs> why are you thinking of us as idiots right now? Um, that was the, that was even worse because I felt like these kids aren't going to get the protection they need as they, well, as I mean, they it's go simple. forth. Yeah, it's pretty obvious. At it's that simple, point. Vic. If, if they acknowledge something as simple as that, as being real, then there's a whole different worldview mm-hmm. that they have to take on. That's true. Right? Yeah. Because if yeah. that could be real, then things that go bump in the night can be real. And tulpas could be real and whatever. I mean, it just goes on and on, the things that now you have to reassess. And so unless it's literally hitting you upside the head, people don't want to acknowledge it. And, of course, and of course, on the other side of the coin, we live in one of the most offended times and oh, yes. mm-hmm. of the whole world. So mm-hmm. if you well, if you say, look at what your child's doing, of course, they're going to dismiss it because that's their little baby and you mm-hmm. just offended them. And so they want to be ignorant, too. <laughs> well, I so. saw it and I got the answers. And yeah. that love and indifference answer is stuck in my head all those years. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. as well it should. Since, yeah. the, since then, I mean, it was, that's really a pretty profound statement. Yeah. Anyway, Sylvia told me one time, I'm going to go back into her, her area. She's uh, an expert on Rotodairy. And Father Birdsong, you listen to the Rotodairy show. And it was hard to keep Rota in her room. Um, she would get out at night after she had been locked in. At Jacksonville, yeah. Yeah, and had been, um, would be found the next morning. And when they asked her who let her out, she would always say, Mrs. Phoenix let her out. And I think your thought is that Rhoda created a topa. That's what I think, yeah. She went through that trauma of <clears throat> losing Charles, losing her fiancé. And that was her focus was on the person that caused this loss which who was nancy phoenix so yeah i told i told vic today uh i just gotta be honest with you sylvia that uh i was messaging vic on this on discord that story it broke my heart and and to hear you tell it and to sense your emotions Lord Jesus, that you, you made me want to cry and choke up just just hearing you talk about it. But that that story really it it, it really got to me. I'm like, this is sad. Very very sad. sad. It, yeah, it was very it was tragic, and I I can't tell you how many times I have told that story, and I I still choke up. Just I well, still I choke up right when now. I tell it. I can tell you right now. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't. I didn't mean to get you emotional, but no, oh, that's that's fine. That's fine. Well, that says a lot about you too. Rhoda's so. our girl, <laughs> and we oh, feel very Sylvia. Very strongly I, about Rhoda. I know that you had mentioned giving talks. Do you have any of these talks recorded and put up anywhere? I would love to be able to see them sometime. Absolutely. Oh golly, yeah. um, gosh, I think it was Chillicothe Library that taped it once and i think our library i think the the library at which i work fond du Lac library i think we recorded the one on lizzie borden that i did hmm. i'll i'll have to i'll have to do some well if you would that. if you yeah. would like a recording platform you have three in front of you <laughs> yeah <laughs> true true yeah. you have three in front of you and uh i believe you I hope I've convinced you that whatever you tell us will be treated with the greatest possible degree of respect. Yes. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah. As um, long as yeah. you're nice to us. As long as you're nice to us. There well, was... yeah, I'm nice to everybody. <laughs> right, l- l- let me take something down to a practical level that I became aware of the other night. I'm kind of a night owl. And so there will be times where I decide, you know, I'm going to go clean up the cabinets in the kitchen, throw away all the stuff that's five years old <laughs> <laughs> you're coming to my house next right <laughs> yeah, you know throw away everything's in the refrigerator that's got 
I can't even tell what it is anymore. Uh, Demanding green voting card and green, green card and voting rights. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so, of course, when you've cleaned everything out, you've got to take out the garbage. And so I'm walking out to take out the garbage at 3, 3.30 in the morning. And my mind is thinking, what if I run into some black-eyed kids? <laughs> <laughs> run. <laughs> or a midnight ice cream about truck. That, unless I'm watching a YouTube video on black-eyed kids. I, I never think about it when I'm taking out the garbage. I'm probably well, lucky that way. I'm weirder than you. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I, but I am. I'm. That's in my mind. I'm thinking, what if I run into some black-eyed kids? And Jay, Jay here we go on the children of the, of the corn again. Children of the corn, and I, and I, <laughs> and I never have. And I'm assuming it'll probably stay that way. But is that opening myself up to danger? Just that thought. Well, I've had the exact same thought around the midnight ice cream trucks as of late. Every time I'm outside and I hear a weird sound, I'm like, oh, gosh, they're coming for me now. So <laughs> I, I know the feeling. What night. is this midnight ice cream truck? Of it's another see? creepy pasta. Uh, oh. but it's it's these uh, ice cream trucks that like drive around a neighborhood and they play exceedingly creepy music and you never see them unless you do and then if you do you happen to go missing and inexplicably so and this music is supposed to get lodged in your head <laughs> and you'll hear it e anywhere you go like random radio stations you'll suddenly hear snippets <clears throat> of it and... <laughs> sylvia this is what i have to deal with you know these guys in this group you and i spend all this time in the dark, alone, asking questions, and we sleep just fine. Don't we think do. about anything, <laughs> walk around in the street. These guys don't do any of that stuff, and they're right. worried about black-eyed children and, and ice cream trucks. I, mean, <laughs> I like to say, I sit in dark, spooky places so that you don't have to. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I just came here for some ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> I like ice cream. Sylvia, so, have you heard of the there's kind of a new monster type that's being discussed on different web <clears throat> websites and different podcasts. And they call the mirrored men. Hmm. Oh, tell me about that. Well, <clears throat> the mirrored men are oddly shaped people or oddly dressed people where you'll generally have three of them exactly mm. the same. And they walk in absolute unison. OK, so so they'll look up and there will be three essentially men in black looking guys walking in absolute perfect step with each other. Hmm. That was and, my first thought was men in black. And and so then they once they become aware of you, the people who are reporting this talk about hours of missing time, you know, Ooh. where suddenly they wake up in their car. It's eight hours later. Their family's going nuts trying to figure out where they are. Hmm. Um, now, of course, stories like this can spread without there being any truth to them at all. Of course. <laughs> Is there always three of them? I've always heard three. Yeah, I've always heard oh. three. Always heard three. And so they call them the mirrored men because they seem to be exact copies of each other. And the only reason, I guess one of the reasons why I don't always think these stories are just made up out of nothing is because of the emotional state of the people telling the story. Mm-hmm. You know, mm. many times these people are really quite upset and they're 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 angry at themselves because they can't figure out exactly what was happening. Mm. No other mirrored men. That people. would be very distressing if something happened to you and you had absolutely no explanation <laughs> for it. That would that would mess with you. Well, yeah, there's the story. I forget the gentleman's name, but. This happened, what, the 80s or 90s? It's essentially the Bermuda Triangle of Michigan, essentially. And the guy went missing for 15 months, came back and claimed to have no recollection, no recollection of where he had been for that entire time, woke up in a field 
like a few miles away from his house, even though where he went missing from was hundreds of miles away. And it's a mystery. And there's been like a quite a few of those cases of little kids that will, you know, three or four days later, they're just found and they have no idea where they had gone. It, mm. Yeah. And so that I think 15 that's all months, part of the, he seemed like was yesterday when he got back. He's like, yeah, I just, just, you know, that whole time didn't feel like time to him. Yeah. Um, huh. Huh. It's like that Bridgewater triangle in new England. What's the Bridgewater triangle? Oh, the Bridgewater triangle is uh, roughly a triangular area in New Hampshire, Connecticut, and Vermont, I think. Mm -hmm. And yeah, there's the, the, the Freetown forest is there, which is very creepy and is the source of paranormal activity ranging from Bigfoot to UFOs to uh, phantoms that walk the woods. Um, there is a cliff there that people have the impulse to throw themselves off of um, Dogtown is I believe is is in the Bridgetown area too Bridgetown Triangle Bridgewater Triangle um, what is Dogtown yeah it's for? just this area of weirdness in New, in <laughs> New Hampshire is that where they did the paranormal show Dogtown was that what what town was it that they did the whole uh, who was in it uh I think it was Nick from who had been on Ghost Adventures. Oh, okay. Oh, oh, uh, what was Nick, that? Nick what was Ross, that show? I don't know. I've never seen any of them. Uh, I'm sure they did an episode on Dogtown. <laughs> what, what yeah, no, there was a show that they did in a town where, like, the whole town was supposed to be haunted. That may not have been it. I I can't remember the name of that. Will someone tell me what Dogtown is? Uh, Dogtown is a, a place in the Bridgewater Triangle where um, people lived there for a while in the 18, 1850s or so. Mm -hmm. And anybody can, David, if, feel free to, to jump in if I'm getting some of these details wrong. But it, it was inhabited at one point, but um, people started going insane from living there oh there was there was a woman who I, at the very end of its inhabited time span there was a woman who had had managed to survive there for decades she was the last person living there and she would if if visitors came by she would come out of her house and just start screaming at him she was kind of a local witch character yeah um, but yeah, that that was the the legend of Dogtown was that people would just go insane living there. There was a woman uh, who who had a nervous breakdown living there, and her husband walked to a different town to get help. I think this was sometime in the eighteen eighties. Um, her husband left for a while to get help for her, and when he came back, she was just absolutely beyond help. Her her mind insane. was absolutely broken. Hmm. The uh, the show I was taking of was Ghost of Shepherdstown, not Dogtown. Oh, okay. So that that was the one with Nick Groff on it. But oh. it, it's interesting. So that had been happening for a long time then. So you're talking yeah. 1880s. So yeah, when it's, was it it's abandoned? completely abandoned now. I mean, you yeah. can still go and visit Dogtown. It's not recommended because it has weird effects on people. But yeah, Dog Dogtown still exists. And you can yeah, walk this, in and visit it, but nobody lives there now. The, yeah, I, I was just checking it uh, myself and said, uh, of course, all this took place in the 1820s. 1820s, okay. 1820s, but it, it's, it's amazing to me that just about every story that I'm reading right now, it, the reason why it was called Dogtown is because they would see uh, packs of wild dogs, mm -hmm. and then it would drive them crazy the dogs and the sound and just lead them into insanity. Well, this and, is a very uh, Lovecraftian yeah. kind of thing. Uh, yeah. This place I don't <laughs> want to visit. Yeah. Hello, it's New England. What do you want? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it kind of reminds me of the Roanoke colony myth. Yeah, well, that's not a, is that a myth? I thought, I mean, they really well, did disappear. Mystery, I mean, 
Yeah. Yeah, you know, the, 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 the Roanoke, the, the lost thing. colony of Roanoke. The, oh yeah, yeah they, they actually yeah. did Virginia. disappear. Mm -hmm. No, no, it's it's in uh, North Carolina. I've been there. North Carolina, okay. Yeah, I've multiple been there. times. Uh, we used to go to Nags Head for for the beach every year, and it's over in Manio, uh, that Roanoke Island. And yeah, I mean that was a real that was the real deal. And the Croatoan was the word carved Croatoan, on the tree. Croatoan. Carved in the tree, yeah. And they've, I mean, I've heard theories, but nobody really knows what happened. Well, and Virginia Dare, the first first person, first European born in the New World, born in the New World. Yeah. Well, the the supernatural TV series took that that word Croatoan and turned it into a demonic virus. Yeah, yeah it sure yeah, did. I remember that episode? <laughs> yeah, which I thought was a pretty good idea. Yeah. All right, how about we do? Well, we could do one of two things. One, we could simply give the floor to Sylvia. If there's something you'd like to talk about. Feel free to do so, or we can do another spin. Uh, or we can do anything else that you guys want to do. Well, well Sylvia's the guest, so let's let's give her the decision. She, let's yeah, give Sylvia got the any decision. really cool stories oh, you want to talk fun. about? Oh, Okay. Well, um, I've been reading about the weird and the supernatural and the paranormal for a long, long time, my entire life, and I've I've heard and read so many stories that my greatest joy is to find a weird, mysterious story that I haven't heard before. <laughs> <laughs> Which doesn't happen very often, probably. It gets hard it, after a while. Not any hard. It really doesn't. But um, so 10 years ago, uh, our new library building opened and we got what's called an opening day collection. We had all of our previous books and we got 30,000 new items. Ooh. Yeah. Super <laughs> fun. So um, one of the new I, one of the books in the opening day collection was a book called Heavenly Bodies. And this was a book about saints relics that um, I, I don't know if I'm, I'm treading on, on dangerous ground here with Father Burson. I'm not aware <laughs> but, of any dangerous uh, ground. here. No so. dangerous ground. here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I. There, there were two books in the opening day collection that really caught my attention. One was. Uh, a book on Dyatlov Pass. Uh -huh. And I had never heard about Dyatlov Pass before. And I devoured this book. It was so fun. But yeah, this other book was, was Heavenly Bodies. And um, it's in, in the 15th century or so, uh, the, the, um, the Protestant Reformation was going on in Europe and a lot of the Protestants were attacking Catholic churches and saying they were idolatrous and, mm -hmm. and destroying mm -hmm. the, the iconography and destroying the saints relics. And in 15, 1590, no, 1578, there was a fellow um, named Bartolomeo Gonzaga who was mm -hmm. living in Rome and he had, a, he owned a vineyard. And he had his workers digging in the vineyard and they dug a little too deep and they broke through into a hole and they discovered several catacombs that were previously unknown. So they started exploring these catacombs and these, these catacombs contained the skeletal remains of people who lived and died in Rome between the second and fifth centuries. Hmm. So the um, the Pope at the time said, hot dang, we just found ourselves a great big cache of early Christian saints. Ah. Forgetting, you know, setting aside the fact that <laughs> Emperor Constantine had made Christianity legal in 313, which was about the time most of these people had been buried there and, and 313 and afterwards. So they, they probably weren't early Christian martyrs. Probably Most not. Were probably just, you know, regular People. Romans who lived and died. And they, they, they could have been Christian, but they probably weren't martyrs. So they, the Catholic Church, with this bounteous supply. <laughs> oh, this is amazing <laughs> and wonderful. <laughs> sent them. <laughs> To the churches, uh, mostly in German-speaking areas, like Germany and Swabia and Austria and places like that. And these churches were so 
jazzed to get these entire skeletons that they blinged them out. They wrapped the <laughs> ribs in gold wire. They, they put them. jewels in the eyes. If somebody <laughs> can find a picture on the, of this on the internet and put it up on the screen, it, it, it's just nuts how uh, bananas they went with it. They, they, they would put rings. They would they would wrap the body, the, the skeleton in gauze. I mean, these were all skeletalized remains. They would wrap the, the fingers in gauze to protect the bones. They would wrap the skulls. Sometimes they would make wax masks to put over the face the the skull so that they had somewhat of a face and they would put jewels in the eyes and they would like cover the the skull with ropes of pearls and part of it was to show reverence for these These saints saints (laughs) air quotes Uh, and part of it was to to remind the parishioners that saw these blinged out skeletons that if you follow the rules of the church and if you live a godly life you will receive treasure in heaven and this is what it might look like (laughs) wow yeah and and they were they were called catacomb and heiligen or holy bodies of the catacombs holy holy body did did they so if they send a a skeleton let's say Mm -hmm. to munster yeah um which has some really beautiful Catholic churches, then did they give that saint a name? This is Saint So-and-so? Sometimes they did. <laughs> Sometimes they some, didn't. Some of these skeletons were, some some were found with um, burial plaques. Okay, okay. Um, sometimes they kind of were really, really relaxed in their interpretation of these plaques. Mm-hmm. They, they said um, their, their theory was that any plaque that had an M anywhere on it stood for martyr. Again, wow. setting aside the fact that it could stand for mensis, Latin month, the month that they died. Um, it could stand for manibus, the, the shades of the dead, the dis manibus. DM was a very common inscription on Roman gravestones. It's dis manibus, which is the shades of the dead. It could stand for memoria. It could stand for Miles, which is soldier. It didn't necessarily well, it have, have to, to be martyr. martyr. <laughs> yeah. So they, they sometimes found names on these plaques. And then when they did, they sent the plaque along and the, the plaque was displayed along with this, this so, um, bedazzled so here are, skeleton. Here are the names. I'm looking at this website. I, I put a link in, in Discord there. Vic. Sweet. You've got St. <laughs> Valerius. And Saint Frederick, Friedrich, Saint Albertus, uh, Saint Valentine, Saint mm-hmm. Benedictus, Saint oh, Luciana, and Saint Gertro, and Saint Valentinus, uh, and Saint Vincentus. Mm-hmm. So I, I wonder if these were names that were on the plaques. Those names sound awfully catholic I'm just saying. <laughs> and they're very very roman as well and sometimes they didn't find a a plaque with them so a lot of the, s- the skeletons went out with the name saint anonymous or saint incognita oh, <laughs> that, man. i am not even nice. remotely making this up no you, i know you're not no <laughs> no these things are really decked out i mean the jewels on these things are absolutely stunning gorgeous yeah. and some of the poses they're put in are quite funny but that's what, uh, that's yeah. what i was laughing at him <laughs> sometimes <laughs> Saint Peter just laid back. it was, there yeah. was that the, the the hand is up in front of the face as a gesture of modesty so yeah, yeah. and it, it was it was wild because they 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 had their criteria of things that will let you know that this skeleton was a martyr um, they included a, a pleasing smell to the bones if the bones smelled nice. Correct. Yes, that was a sign of martyrdom. Um, if they had a goblet next to them with dried liquid in it, that, that was blood. They, that was that was the martyr's blood. And very often, these martyrs were posed holding the goblet of their own dried blood. And of course, this was most likely perfume or wine or something that had been buried with the the Roman body and had just 
dried up and left a residue in the cup. It was probably wine, not probably not blood, but you know. <laughs> I had never heard this it. story yet either, <laughs> Sylvia. This What's is that? a great one. I had never heard this story either. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's and just the, the, there aren't the too many of those. Are, <laughs> it, they're, well, they're so fun. All right. So I want to can I expand on that a little bit? Yeah. Please. Um we have a mutual friend who's a deeply, deeply devout Catholic. And he was telling me the other day about or us the other day about going to a display of relics at a church somewhere where he was all class a relics ah. but there are different classes of relics right and uh the, the whole thing started getting in my mind you know what is the economy of relics so every catholic church every catholic altar apparently has a relic of some kind in it you know a bone or a fingernail or something the true cross yeah. yeah part of the true cross all this kind of stuff everyone's got a uh, got a relic well where do these relics come from where do you where do you get new relics well i mean this pope took the bull by the horns and got him some relics <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah yeah he I said mean, i mean he, he said boy oh boy look look at all these relics we have oh, you get a skeleton then you get a skeleton everybody gets a skeleton <laughs> well i was i was just thinking where you know where do these relics come from let's say you you dig up um what saint bernadette okay right but saint bernadette well, the skull of saint john the baptist when he was a child right when he was a child <laughs> <laughs> That's that's a good trick there. So, <laughs> <laughs> only thing I can think of in hearing that is uh, Ricky Bobby praying to sweet baby <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> oh, Talladega Nights! Talladega Nights! Talladega yeah. Nights! Well, you uh, you uh, cannot forget Kuhan Luke at the very beginning. I don't care if it rains or freezes, as long as I got my plastic Jesus. Oh. on the dashboard of my car. <laughs> Pink and Pleasant Plastic Jesus Company of Del Rio, Texas. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm going to try one more spin. Um, we tried, Sylvia, to keep this around. I mean, if somebody can stick for two hours, we're happy. If you're getting tired, please let us know. Uh, if you're enjoying the dork talk, we'll keep going. I am absolutely enjoying the dork talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay hitting f9 good enough uh, i think i'm gonna hit f9 again <laughs> <laughs> i don't care if it rains or freezes as long as i got my plastic jesus glued to the dashboard of my car <laughs> <laughs> i think that just might be a clip there dave what do you say <laughs> yeah I th i'm thinking so that's a trailer right there <laughs> Okay, uh, here we go. I don't know some of these, so I'm going to lay them out, and anybody who wants to talk about them can. Ghost in general, human, intelligent, repeating, etc. Psychic self-defense, which I think is something that Dave thinks about and talks about some. Flying jelly bags. Let's create a new monster horror terror right here, right now. Uh, 19 Hertz, Infrasound, and Brotherhood of the White Temple. Hmm. Any of that resonate with anybody? What was the first one again? Ghosts, Ghosts. in general. Oh, Hum no. Oh, okay. Never mind. I got it. Yeah. Human, <clears throat> whatever ghosts might be. All right. Well, I'm, I'll ask since nobody's nobody's chiming in. So, Sylvia, your experience, I mean, you've done a lot of investigating from a from your perspective. What's your take on ghosts, spirits, the things you've experienced in investigating at the different sites you've been? What's your worldview on that? Oh, well. I do subscribe to the theory that there are several different kinds of ghosts. They are there are the the um, ones that are earthbound and 
can't leave the place where they suffered some sort of trauma. There are spirits that can go back and forth that are not earthbound, that, that can travel from wherever it is they go back to some place where they found joy and peace in life. There are the uh, recurring, the, the, the stone tape theory ghosts that, that just hang around and uh, do their residual thing and they're not conscious of, of anything. Um, my favorite are the ones that are not earthbound, the ones that want to communicate because they because they realize that people are out there looking for them and they want to interact with a living human again. Uh, that's, that's my favorite kind of ghost because that's the, that's the kind of ghost that you get the most interaction with and the, the best EVPs from. Um, I, I have friends that are psychic mediums and they have, I don't want to say this because it's rude, but they've proven themselves to me time and time again. So I trust them when they say, uh, well, somebody came through on the spirit box and they, they said, um, thank you for the candy that Sylvia left on our tombstone. Um, because I, I do try to leave little bits of things for the, the people that that I'm trying to contact. I'll bring Rhoda flowers. And if I'm going to visit a child's grave, if I, if I go to Villisca and, and visit with the, the murdered children there, I'll bring candy for them. Um, and the, the folks on the other side have gotten to realize that, that I'm the one that's putting Swedish fish on their gravestones. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have a question. Yeah. Um, um, and, and, and please excuse my ignorance. Uh, like I said, I, I, after 31 years, I realized I don't know a thing. Uh, <laughs> but, but there was one time that I was in the midst of an exorcism and, uh, I was given some, uh, uh, some counseling and the person told me, okay, are you sure you're dealing with the demonic? Or are you dealing with a ghost? Ah. Now, for me personally, it's very hard for me to draw that line. If, if you know what I'm talking about. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. But but okay, the, that that could be question number one. Mm -hmm. I would like to I would like to hear the difference if you have one. Number two, uh, you mentioned uh, spirits that can't pass over. Mm -hmm. uh, that kind of sounds like the what the Roman Catholic world would call purgatory. If you thought about it, yeah. And, it's, and so, so I mean, not necessarily fact, but it kind of it kind of goes. It just can't, sounds kind of familiar. But I would like to know your thought through your experience on those two subjects since, since okay. we're on this subject sure yeah um well let's let's do the second one first and then we'll see if i can remember okay. what the first one was okay <laughs> <laughs> um oh that's right that's right okay um so the second one earthbound spirits and the concept of purgatory um I was raised in the church, in the Orthodox Church, mm -hmm. and I went to Catholic grade school for a couple of grades. So, yeah, I'm familiar with limbo and purgatory, mm -hmm. and I know they're two different things. Um, I think that an earthbound spirit and someone in purgatory are two very different animals. A soul that is in purgatory, um, well... I'm going to give you my take on it and what okay. I have come to believe. Okay. Um, I don't think that there is a purgatory. I think, and I, I, I'm not entirely convinced there's a hell. I think that is, those are constructs of 
our own making that we might carry with us after death. Um, And it takes us some time once we get onto the other side to realize that, you know what, we don't have to suffer anymore. We don't have to be in doubt anymore. We're there. We're with the people we love. If we can only realize that. Um, I'm reminded of the the scene in the last battle in the Chronicles of Narnia, where the, the dwarves think they're still in that shed and they can't see that they're in heaven. They're in the afterlife. They're still stuck in the thought that they're in the shed. So that's from everything I've read and been told. That's, that's my personal worldview. Um, your mileage may vary. Uh, <laughs> earthbound spirits, on the other hand, are spirits that haven't even reached the level of purgatory. They either don't realize they're dead or they can't accept that they're dead or they have gone through such trauma at the moment of death that they are stuck there either in a loop as a as a residual or as an earthbound spirit where where they're tied to the place they are because they can't move on um i hope that makes sense i mean they haven't invaded as far as purgatory um no that i mean that 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 actually gives i think it makes a lot of sense because that's also the reason behind of giving last rites. There you go. So, so, so they, they're passed on, but they need that assurance going to the eternal life. That is that's, an excellent, mm-hmm. excellent point. Yeah. Now, the, the first question is, is the, 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 the demonic difference. versus, yeah. Um, when I was doing research for hunting demons, Um, I talked to a lot of people about demons and, um, their experience with demons. Um, I have a a friend named David Lowry who has had experience with battling demonic entities and other assorted nasties. And he was the one who said, who, who reassured me that there are a lot of times, notwithstanding what Mr. Zach Bagan says, that <laughs> what you're dealing Sorry. with is not necessarily <laughs> demonic. It's it's just what he calls a, a nasty head ghost. Okay. Um, I feel that I, again. I've I've read an awful lot um, of the literature. And from my understanding, a demonic entity is something that has never been human. Never been human. And you guys would probably back me up on that 100%. Um, a, a nasty head ghost is somebody who was deeply unpleasant while they were alive. Um, and they've just carried that personality with them. Exactly, yeah. yeah. No. I've, I've found in investigations and from talking to other investigators that somebody who was pleasant in life, like your your great aunt Joan, <laughs> whatever, yeah. who still haunts your house or the neighbor who's who passed away, um, who always baked your kids cookies, they're still going to be pleasant ghosts in the afterlife. Somebody who is a complete jerk is probably going to be a complete jerk in the afterlife too. And that's what I, that's what David meant by really nasty head ghosts. They're just deeply unpleasant people to deal with, even after they have passed on. Have you ever run into one of those yourself? Uh, I have, but um, he didn't give me a whole lot of trouble. He gave people trouble that I knew. Um, It is a fellow who hangs out in one of the buildings at the Peoria State Hospital, the Pollock Hospital. Um, He used to be a a custodian there, and he still sees the basement as his territory. What is it with these guys? 
<laughs> I've had something. I've had that exact same experience. Yeah, yeah. And he's just this crusty old dude who doesn't like people wandering around his basement. And he's all like, what, what are these people doing here? Just get out and, yeah, leave me alone to do my job is basically how his attitude is. And it's mostly custodians. Yeah, I was just watching something at Farrar School just earlier this evening where one of the spirits there is the janitor who hangs out in the basement and and tells people get out <laughs> well you're walking that's on crazy. his clean floor come on there you go yeah, <laughs> that's probably it yeah I messed up my so, but, so yeah, let there, me say that oh go ahead jj oh i'm just going to chime in and saying that I, I think that there is a definite difference between the supernatural and the preternatural and yeah. The infernal yeah. are always preternatural because they are locked to either time or location. Whereas the supernatural, sometimes they are, sometimes, sometimes they're not. They're not. <clears throat> sure. Who yeah. knows? Makes sense. So, so yeah. in in my experience, I've had something follow me home. Mm. It was like the maintenance guy or the custodian, and it was yeah. extremely negative. And it just drained me. It was like walking through water, you know, for days mm. until I realized, you know, what finally became aware enough to know what was going on and got rid of it. But mm -hmm. it wasn't like possession, right? right? It was it was influence. It was draining. It was activity around the house. It followed me to yes. work. It affected people around me. It drained people around me mm. at work. I mean, it was really, really bad, mm -hmm. but it wasn't what I would call it. Was, it certainly wasn't demonic. And I've had a demonic experience as well. Also, wow. thankfully, not possession, but demonic attacks that lasted for several years. Mm -hmm. And that was hateful that was mm -hmm. that malicious. was horrible it was yeah. malicious it was it yeah. was you know and the feeling between the two one was just i felt drained my wife felt like something was hanging around that really didn't like her mm. the other i felt like it did not want me to exist ah right mm -hmm. it, there was mm -hmm. hatred there and and so I get the the not the I get the the ghostly sort of negative head cold kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. But the question, I guess, would be: Can something like this, a uh, 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 angry spirit or whatever, actually possess somebody? And that's sort of what you were getting at, right, Father Birdsong? Yeah. Yes, and 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 the reason why I say that is is I I, I actually believe it could. I mean. Mm -hmm. Because if if someone just like Sylvie said, if someone was a jerk in the natural life, well, of course they're going to be an ass in the afterlife. And so, whether you're demonic or not, if you're if you're just a ugly person, you're going to want to do harm in some way, even if it's just just mentally uh, mm -hmm. and so, emotionally attack you to to be that yeah. jerk. You know. I guess my question around that would be when you look at the demonic world and possession you're talking about legal rights right yes. in the end yes. there is some legal right given to the demonic to allow for that possession to take place through your free will you can accept the possession or the perfect possession or the integration or, or whatever you want to call well, it but yeah, through stuff into, you've done but, too yeah but you cannot help the attack. You cannot help the, uh, just like we're dealing with a unruly person. They're going to be mean to you, right? Right, right. You they, can't help that. They have a right to attack you. They exactly. don't have a right to inhabit you. Inhabit you, yes. So, exactly. so what would be the mechanism that would allow a ghost, angry or not, to possess you and the only thing that i've come across so far and we've had a conversation i don't remember mm -hmm. when we had this conversation vic but it was about uh out of body experience and astral projection where you've mm -hmm. left your body and potentially a ghost or spirit could enter it well that's because you allowed yourself to become vulnerable 
Right. Oh, but very in vulnerable. this case, you're yeah. leaving yourself open. Your mm-hmm. house is essentially empty. Mm-hmm. Someone takes possession of it. But it wouldn't have to be demonic necessarily to do that <clears> because <throat> you vacated the president. President. The president. I can't speak. Well, OK. <laughs> you, you vacated the house. Right. Let mm-hmm. me let me put it to you this way. You as a husband. You are the priest of your home. OK. If you neglect that, if you leave your home and no one's there, you just invited the door for everybody to come in mm. because, because you're not there. You're not protecting it. And so if you fool around with a supernatural entity, whether ghost or demon or whatever, and and, and you make yourself vulnerable, or you dismiss your presence at your home, so to speak. You just said, okay, come in and mess with me. <laughs> you know, but you can't, you, you, there, there's nothing that you can do. Just like, just like Vic said, they got the power to mess with you, but they don't have the power to inhabit you unless well, you give it up. But then to further complicate matters. Okay. You also have many stories of other types of entities that can also possess, but they don't necessarily hate. Uh, Divots, for one, uh, they can be viewed as more, I guess, if you put it into D&D terms, more chaotic, neutral. They're just completely (laughs) out for themselves. Uh, You got Um, Josh smiling now. (laughs) You've got uh, Jen, you know, which some liken to be demons. Others say that they're not because they can be both good, neutral or evil. Mm -hmm. And then finally, I've my experience in Japan of being psychically attacked. Mm -hmm. I can't put a classification on what that thing was because it took the guise of a human shape but it inflicted pain that of a sort that i have never felt before or after so i don't know so again when i was doing uh research for hunting demons i discovered and this is a real treat for me to look learn something new, I discovered that there is a great deal of difference between the Western and the Eastern concept of demon. One of the things I found um, about the jinn is that uh, the jinn is is mostly a Middle Eastern thing, of course. And there, in Egypt especially, Egyptian women have have kind of a secret weapon. Uh, women in Middle Eastern cultures and Near Eastern cultures are, you know, second class citizens and they they don't have the best of lives most of the time. But there is a very specialized jinn called the czar and it only possesses women. And wow. this is very prevalent in Egypt. And what the czar does is it possesses the woman and the woman goes to her husband and says, I am being possessed by a czar. The only way to cure this is to have a party. And it, that, that is a thing in Egyptian society. And if a woman is possessed by a czar, the only way to cure her, the only way to exercise her is for her husband to bring her gifts of jewelry, of flowers, of, of good things to eat. And they have a party and they have a, <laughs> they, 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 it dancing till the wee hours of the morning to exercise this demon from this woman. And that it's, it's a great excuse to have a party. Great excuse to have a party. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was utterly charmed by this, by this uh, revelation. <laughs> that is fascinating. <laughs> is, is, is a czar the same person as, Oh, what I, the name's one on my head, Josh. Asterisk, as, Ishtar. Ashtar. Oh, Ishtar. No, no. It's not no, the same something thing. entirely okay. different. Okay. No, Azar is a, is a type of jinn, and okay. Ishtar was a Babylonian goddess. Goddess, yeah. Yeah. 
It's yeah. amazing to me how much she looks like the Statue of Liberty. <laughs> <laughs> Look at it. I'm serious. It looks just like yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And then I also discovered that um, there was a female Buddhist monk. She was the 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 first female Buddhist monk to start her own practice, and um, she she meditated. She she was in a temple that was next to a pond, and the pond was guarded by a naga or a water demon. Mm-hmm. And this monk that was meditating in the temple amongst her followers. And she meditated with such intensity that she levitated and floated out of the window of the temple and into the tr- branches of the tree that was over this pond that the Naga inhabited. And the Naga was very upset that a human had invaded its domain Mm -hmm. and Mm. it threatened to attack the monk and the monk offered her body as food for the naga and the naga was so impressed by the sacrifice that the monk was willing to make that the naga told all of its naga friends and they all swore to protect any followers of this monk from now till the end of time so that is the buddhist attitude towards demons oh, is yeah. if you think that you have it, it, it it's basically ask ask what the demon wants if you have a demon of smoking cigarettes or if you have a demon of drinking too many cans of soda in a day you you meditate and you ask the demon what it wants and you say well demon why do you why do you feel like i have to overeat and the demon will say well it's you know because i i feel insecure and i want to make sure that i have enough food and you say you know what you know what? i can take care of that i can eat healthy food and i can make sure that you're nourished so and that that will settle the demon down so it's a really fascinating way to look at demons from an eastern point of view is mm-hmm. find out what the demon wants and but in this particular case, the demon did actually eat the monk, right? No, no. It was, <laughs> it, it was so impressed with this potential. Oh, sacrifice. it let the monk survive, survive too. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. The monk survived. Yeah. That'd crazy. be a different story, Dave. I mean, look, we're going to protect all these other guys. <laughs> well, but man, was that one good monk. I was <laughs> that like, was a good <laughs> monk. <laughs> man. Was no, I just thought it was a really interesting way to, to look at things. So the person that you were talking to who was running into the, what do you say, nasty head ghosts? Yeah, um, head ghosts. Uh-huh. Uh, uh, just, just people who were, you know, jerks in life and they decided they're going to be jerks after after life. Mm-hmm. Did he run into other things also? He did. Yes, he did. Um, David actually has a full color beautifully done tattoo of St. Michael, the archangel on his, on his, arm on his there. arm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So St. Michael is always with him and he, he has, he didn't share details with me, but he has had, he has had reason to have St. Michael protect him. <laughs> well, it's a, it's a kind of like I tell everybody, uh, you do know why Michael the name Michael means he's like God, right? Mm-hmm. That's because he made me. <laughs> Michael Birdsong. <laughs> oh, gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I don't. I don't have any. Um, my Michael. wife won't. My wife won't believe me on that one, though. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to talk about one thing. Since you've talked to people who deal with demons. You, you've written a book about this, which I'm going mm-hmm. to get and read. And I'd like to have it. Yeah. at some point in the future, I'm going to write to you and ask you some questions about it. Or yeah, super. But I have never run into the exorcist movie type demons, you know, the levitation and this kind of thing. But I ran into some, a several year period of my life. 
uh, working in healthcare, I ran into some mm. things that I am certain were in the bodies or minds of people and that the people who were being possessed were 100% okay with it. They oh. definitely made a uh, an agreement that, yes, you get to stay here and I get to do the things I want to do. <clears throat> or maybe, or you get to do the thing. I get to do the things you want me to do. I guess maybe better putting it. Mm -hmm. When I was around those people, <clears throat> it was not like being around another human. Okay, I'm mm -hmm. I'm I'm talking to four other humans right now. Mm -hmm. All of you have depth of personality. All of you have, you know, the ability to talk and to connect in a human manner. This was like connecting with insects. I, I, yeah. I, I, I coined this term insect nihility because mm -hmm. that's what it felt like to me. I, mm. I, I felt like I was around something that was 100% non-human and oh boy, did it hate me. Wow. And did it, I mean, and, and it hated all of humanity. I just happened to be there and Although I don't consider myself to have any kind of psychic power, I I seem to be able to see what they were, and that pissed them off. Mm. Um, and I was able, since it was a healthcare environment, I was able to, after a while, not be around those people anymore. But mm -hmm. did he ever talk about anything like that? No, but I could see how that could happen. I could see if someone had a very weak personality to begin with. And if they were approached by an entity like that, who promised them attention, power, power, I can see how someone with a weak personality would succumb to that. Well, yeah. it's just in all the demon talk I've <clears throat> all the demon talk that I've experienced since then, I've never heard anybody relate stories exactly like mine. Um, well, no, I, I Malachi Martin did, and yeah. in his oh, book, yeah. yeah, he did. You're right. I guess I was the just talking about possessed. regular old people, people, and <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, what, and, what you're not no. personal friends with, with <laughs> close personal friends with Malachi Martin? No. <laughs> <laughs> you, Vic, that'd be uh, a neat trick. Yeah, one, one thing since he passed away. Yeah, oh, one, but... one thing, Vic is is I will say this. Uh, first of all, I want I want you to look at your profession back then too. Yeah, you were a nurse, right? Yes. Okay, and I always I always tell people I said there's a difference between nurses. Uh, number one, there's one that cares. Number two, there's one that just wants a paycheck. Hmm. Well, yeah. And, uh -huh. and, 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 and hearing your story, uh, y'all hold on. There's, there's a method around this madness. Okay. Mm -hmm. But, but in, in your story, which I thought was awesome, by the way, um, it, it really showed your heart and showed that you were one that actually care for people. Maybe too much. Okay. Well, I don't, I don't, well, okay. But, um, for professional effectiveness. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, but, but you have to understand, we can tie that all the way back to the sin of Lucifer himself and why the angels, why those angels fell with him. Uh, because they hate you. Yes. They don't like you. They don't like anything about you. Because, you know, according to Holy Scripture, God made you in his image. Mm -hmm. All right, so what was what was the fall of Lucifer? It was, it's pride, of course. Pride. So I'm not good enough for you. You call me the great and morning star, the most beautiful and most treasured of all angels. And now you're going to create this substandard being to me. Well, I'm going to take him out. Yeah, a, a monkey with some will. Exactly. <clears throat> so, so I mean, so you you have to look at it that way. There, there. 
there's some spirits out there that just don't like us just because of who we are. Oh, yeah. yeah and there's yeah, yeah. nothing we can well, do definitely. about it. Yeah. But, I think the interesting thing about it is, you know, in, in my experiences, I felt that, right? I felt the mm-hmm. hatred for, for my existence. Mm-hmm. But but I think what you may be getting at, Vic, is the fact that you felt like these individuals were perfectly possessed. I did. And yeah. that may be a situation where it doesn't have to attack. It's not like it's attacking. I mean, if you're interacting with a demon, most of the time it's because it's, you know, oppressing you or having something to do with you. In this mm-hmm. case, it's got what it wants. And you're almost getting to see the literally the personality of a demon. Yeah. Uncontrolled. Because you're right. invading his space right then. Yeah. Right. yeah. Yeah. But I mean, it's it's not like there's somebody inside with him fighting. Right. He doesn't have to hide anything. He doesn't have to well, he can no, literally just, just express like himself. Yeah. This exactly. is just I can do what I want to do. Mm-hmm. So you're getting to see the full depth of personality and the way they are versus, you know, bits of them that you might see in somebody who's fighting a possession or whether it's, you know, an attack on you. That makes a lot of sense. Well, since we started doing this, I now have my holy water right next to my computer. (laughs) There you go. I have my Amore close to hand. And and, and occasionally I use my holy water. (laughs) If y'all need any more, I'll ship you some. I'll ship you some. (laughs) Well, it is now... um, Two hours and 21 minutes into our show. That's generally nice. the point where people start to get kind of tired. Um, I want to ask Sylvia. Sylvia, look. My gosh, you're like a gift from God. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you know, in, in, in terms of just being the best guest we could possibly have. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Well, I hope I make great. it onto the Halloween show. Then. You, oh, oh, believe me, you'll be the Halloween show. There's just no <laughs> question about that. You know, nice. You know, for uh, uh, you know, for dork talk. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're really not naming the show that. Just so you know, that <laughs> I prefer my legacy. Uber you, geek. You've, you've destroyed my the, legacy. The Uber Geek. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> So I think it's probably about time to kind of start winding things down. Uh, does anybody have any final things they'd like to make part of the rundown? I'm just looking forward to the next movie night. <laughs> we'll make it a good one. I, I do want to I mean not for now, but I do want to come back at some point and talk about psychic defenses. Because that cool. that I cool. think that has been a thought that has preoccupied my mind for most of my life. <laughs> well, I mean, growing up in a house that you consider to be haunted, what yeah. else is going to be in your mind? Well, All it, right, so there's a good question. Sylvie, what do you do for protection? I Ooh. make a tea. I have um, a jar of water that I have left out under a full moon. And I take that water and use it to brew a tea. And I put in very strong herbs like comfrey and nettle and sage and cinnamon. Um, Sometimes I put hibiscus in. And honey is a very powerful antimicrobial, antibiotic sort of thing. So I, I consider honey very strong as well. And that's what I do if I am going on an investigation that I know is somewhere that is has the possibility of negative energy. And I make this tea and I bring it with me. And I had a very interesting experience with the tea now that you bring it up. Um, it, it tastes wonderful. It tastes herby and grassy and sweet. And it's, it's really a wonderful thing. But I went to the Sally House in Atchison, Kansas, And I knew that I might run into trouble there. So I had a quart jar of this tea. And David, you're sitting there drinking a a cup of tea. You know that, you know that it's tea, right? Right. So I 
got to the Sally house and opened my jar and started drinking my tea and it had gelled. Wow. Gel. Huh. I could not choke down more than about a third of it. So I. That's interesting. How long had that tea been in, in that container? Uh, I made it that afternoon. You made it that afternoon. Yeah. So wow. I have never had that happen before. That's different. Since. Yeah. That's, that's, uh, I can't think of anything in the ingredients you listed that would cause it to do that. Well, I could think you could possibly have uh, an out of control biofilm, but that would take months. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I, and, and, I, and you wouldn't have been able to choke any of it down because it would have been. Yeah, it was yeah. gross. It was like drinking me- melted jello, but it, it didn't well, taste as good as melted jello. And it was just so it the, was such an odd. The nature of the tea, even though it became gelled, the taste of yeah. it was different. The smell was different. The No, no. It smelled fine. It tasted fine. It tasted exactly oh. the way it was supposed to. It was just the texture and the, 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 texture, the viscosity yes. of it. Well, the, 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 the only the, jailing, the, the only, yes. yeah, the only jailing ingredient she put in there would have been the honey. Yeah, but that's and, not and enough. She, she would. That's, 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 that's what I was going to say. Enough. She 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 would have to pour a whole pound of honey in there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it was well, only a couple of tablespoons. Yeah, unless and the I would honey expect came that from, from a... like chia seeds or something. Well, I mean, do you consider that to be an attack? I mean, a, a way of taking out your defenses. I kind of thought yeah. it was. That's what it, it sounds yeah. like to me. Yeah. Yeah. Lacking any other information and lacking any other explanation for it. That's... Hey, Jay, were you going to say something? I was going to say, unless the honey came from the millified man, I can't see oh, how yeah. I could <laughs> tell <it. laughs> No, gross, dude. Ew. <laughs> Oh, All right, man. so you you know what kind of dork talk environment you're in, and that we immediately knew what he was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. I would like to end the program on the word grok. Because... Oh, can I say one more thing? <laughs> oh, yes, you can. Okay, um, you mentioned movie nights. Yeah, we do okay. movie nights, and you're welcome to so, attend. Oh, thank you. We should totally watch a new movie that has just come out. It came out last month, I think. And it's called Nandor Fodor and the Talking Mongoose. Whoa. Like Jeff the Talking Mongoose? Yes. Yes. It's Jeff's story. It's Jeff's it's story. story. It's Simon Pegg. Simon Pegg plays Nandor Fodor. Christopher Lloyd plays Harry Price. <laughs> it's awesome. It is so much fun. Oh, my gosh. Yes. So, it's it's on streaming services right now. Show of hands. I love Simon Pegg. That's who, awesome. Who knows the Jeff the Talking Mongoose story? No. Oh. JJ, you don't know that? Dave, you know it? No. Father Birdsong, you nope. know it? Nope. Okay, we're... okay, so in 1931, there was a family living on the Isle of Man. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it was the James Irving and his wife, Margaret, and their, their daughter, Vwari, who was in her late teens. They became aware of knocking noises in their walls. And the knocking turned into thumping and kind of really got their attention at that point. And they they realized that they had some sort of entity in their house. And it was causing all sorts of disturbance and poltergeist activity and lots of noises. There was one evening when Vwari decided to try and sleep through all this noise. And she was trying to put herself to sleep by singing nursery songs to herself and singing to herself. And the entity started singing along with her. Hmm. And soon it had taught itself English. And it introduced itself as a talking mongoose. Hmm. And it said his name was Jeff, Mm G-E-F. And Jeff was... Jeff was hilarious. Jeff was... (laughs) He tried to be helpful sometimes, but he was mostly just absolutely obnoxious. He <laughs> grew very attached to James Irving, would call him Jim, was very friendly <laughs> with the family. Um, he would say, hey, Jim, how about some grubbo? And they would feed this mongoose. <laughs> they, would, they would feed him like carrots and grapes and apples, and they, they would feed him like, like cookies and stuff. 
And <laughs> one time when he overate and he said, oh, oh, Jim, I am sick. I am ill. And he just started barfing up carrots. <laughs> and I just hesitate to, I can't even imagine what the sound of a ghost warfing up a hairball would sound like. <laughs> I, I gotta watch yeah. this. That sounds too yeah. good. It yeah. is hysterical. It, it, I love Jeff. I and what I, I am a supporter of the, the production company that did this movie, so I got to see it when it came. It was in theaters for a limited release, and it was actually at the normal theater, which is like 45 minutes away from me. Mm-hmm. So I went to see it on opening night, and they gave us a bunch of swag to hand out, and I, I still have buttons that say i believe in jeff and another button that says jeff is a hoax <laughs> <laughs> and um jeff he, he was very boastful he said if you if you ever saw me you would be petrified mummified you would be turned into a pillar of salt yes and yeah he was he was very <laughs> full of himself he's kind of like a uh a benign version of the bell witch um, yes yes and he would, he would go out and he would, he would hunt rabbits and he would bring rabbits home for, for the family to, to cook and eat. And there were workmen on the Isle of Man that swore that Jeff stole their lunches. He probably did. Jeff was known all over the island. So, yeah. Mm-mm-mm. Yeah. Jeff well, is. At some point in the future, totally JJ, we should be able to make that the uh, the next movie. Or a, yeah, movie. yeah, we can. A that next so movie. Fun. I would tune in to watch that again. <laughs> well, <laughs> if we get the movie night going, believe me, I will let you know. The oh. um, <laughs> this, this is on, on JJ's Southern Demonology uh, Discord server, which oh, okay, cool. is not as busy as it used to be, but... For a while there, it was one of the best places I've been on the internet. It was, you know, friendly. It was kind of like this, you know, pe- people talking about things that they found interesting. So, well, Bick, yes. uh, one one last thing. And yes, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt. No, could we, could we put up a link uh, so we can share and see the information for Sylvia's books? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 We'll put that on both the paranormal rundown uh, show notes. Um, I can get up on Discord. And yeah. There you go. Yeah. We should, we can definitely get Sylvia's books up there. Okay. Yeah. And Sylvia, where do do you have, uh, do you have any other like uh, social media site you like people to go to or link any page or anything like that? Absolutely. Uh, My my website is. Sylvia Schultz.wordpress.org, and that's S H U L T S. It's a weird spelling, I know. So, Sylvia Schultz.wordpress.org. Dot com. <laughs> Sylvia Schultz.wordpress.com. I always okay. do that. Uh, and I am on Facebook as well. There is a page for Fractured Spirits, there's a page for Lights Out, which is my podcast, a true ghost story podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, the WordPress site is where people are most likely to find me. Excellent. So you have a podcast called Lights Out. Called Lights Out. Yes, yes. It's um, I go out and uh, find true ghost stories, and um, I ha- there are so- sometimes I interview people. There are sometimes that I wander around a cemetery that is supposed to be haunted. There was one time I went to, when I was coming back from the Sally House, I went to Mount Mora Cemetery, which is not haunted, but it's gorgeous. So I did a show on that. Um, I spent three weeks ghost hunting in England and Scotland earlier this year. So the next half dozen episodes or so are going to be English and Scottish experiences. So that's, oh, that's be wonderful. One on a bun. I am so looking forward to the next half dozen episodes or so. Sylvia. Excellent. Sylvia, does your Facebook say Sylvia Zethmar Schultz? Yes, that's me. Okay. I just friended you. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah. Well, good. it's good that you are reclaiming the title Lights Out from the horrendous movie. <laughs> well, that was a true. Short, that was a horrendous video movie. Was that's good. for sure. The movie was awful. <clears throat> yeah. It was a painful My movie. husband yeah. is my title guy. He comes up with all my really good titles. He's the one who came up with 44 Years in Darkness and Gone on Vacation and Days of the Dead and and Hunting Demons, come to think of it, and Fractured Spirits. Yeah. 
What does that so term he's, mean? He's guy, and he's the one who came up with fractured or uh, uh, lights out as well. What does that term mean, fractured spirits? Oh, um, well, he he knew I was writing about a mental asylum. He ah. actually grew up in this area, so he was one of the kids who who um, did some urban exploring back in the day when the police were still patrolling the the area, and. Um, yeah, he would hear weird. I, I asked him one time, I said, I, did you have guys ever hear strange things when you were in the buildings and down in the tunnel systems and stuff? And he said, we hear heard weird, weird things all the time. And I said, well, what did you think it was? <laughs> he said, well, we just thought it was other kids horsing around and, and exploring the same way we were. Now, he is the complete skeptic. He is the the biggest skeptic I know, worse than my sister. So in his so, mind, these yeah. were just other kids that were doing these things. Yeah, yeah. He he just thought it was other kids horsing around. Whenever they heard weird noises, they just put it down to other humans. But he, so he was familiar with the Peoria State Hospital, and when he he realized I was writing a book about it, and I asked him for a title, and he suggested that fractured spirits and it was just such a perfect title that i thought it, it just speaks to the the fractured state of the the minds of the people that found solace and help here absolutely mm. yeah great title can i ask Thank you one you. can i ask you one last question yeah this is a it's something that just keeps going in my mind mm -hmm. aside from things like jeff okay which probably isn't formerly human probably not maybe <laughs> human ghosts whatever type they might be once they are out of a human body can they learn can they acquire new knowledge hmm. i think they can can i um, expound on that i would agree with that uh yeah i, I uh I also agree with that because same thing that we were talking about earlier during our break. If you think about that human spirit and you, and you say they have to learn something, that's where we also talked about the administration of last rites. Right, right, right. Yeah. So if you tie those two together, they are actually learning something and they're given, they are given permission. So to speak, Hey, it's okay. For you to move on. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be here anymore. Okay. Yeah. Move yeah. on. Well, and even if you're if if you're prescribing solely to the Catholic, you know, doctrine of purgatory. Yeah. Doctrine or philosophy, whatever you would call it, the the concept of purgatory, mm -hmm. the spirit would have to be able to learn to while on. in purgatory in order to move on. That exactly. is correct. Oh yeah. Yeah, that I'll is correct. That Dave, you're a pretty smart guy. <laughs> well, I, I have a question. So uh, if can you please send Vic or or us, whatever, a, a link to your podcast, because I I have another lights out podcast, but I don't think it's the same one. Is it uh, a black screen with light white letters that say lights out with Sylvia Schultz? No. It's oh. it's a uh, it's lights out with a skeleton going like this, you know, and me. a candle. And I didn't think it was because I <laughs> listened to it and I'm like, I don't, I didn't make that connection. Yeah. <laughs> so can you send us a link to yours so I make sure I get the right one in the show notes? Yeah, absolutely. Perfect. Well, Dave, like you said, I mean, there are thousands of podcasts out there with one episode, two episodes. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. Sure. And they just just stopped. Okay. This is Vic Hermanson telling Sylvia Schultz that as far as I'm concerned, she has a standing invitation to come to the Paranormal Rundown anytime she wants. Absolutely. Oh, thank you very and, much. And I, I understand that your life is probably dull and boring. And you don't have much to do. So <laughs> <laughs> when, 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 if there's ever a time when you're saying, you know, I really need something to do, give me a call. We'll find out something to do. Um, <laughs> Beautiful. Also, uh, you've got... Uh, I, a gang of nerds here engaging in dork talk any help you need with computers audio any of that kind of stuff feel free to let us know thank you <laughs> and uh websites etc websites etc um sylvia uh as the new guy on the block 
I I got to tell you, these three guys, they're wonderful. Mm-hmm. And, I, <laughs> and, and, and as the new guy and even as a priest, and I've told them this, I can even be vulnerable and transparent with them because they really care. These are a great group of guys. Well, thank you for welcoming me, welcoming me so warmly. I do appreciate it. Well, Sylvia, thank you. And so I guess we will bring the, what is this one, day of the 8th, the 7th? I uh, don't even. <laughs> yeah. <You'll> add, <laughs> who, okay. who knows? Avalon Lee is going to have to correct you again. Avalon Lee is going to have to correct me. <laughs> we, we'll figure it out in post. We'll figure it out in post. <laughs> All right. I guess I'm going to end the meeting unless anybody's got anything else. And once again, Sylvia, thank you so much. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. you. Absolutely. Great show. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Avalon, we haven't seen each other in what, 70, 80 years? Ah, you're looking just as uh, good as usual. But I have to ask you one more time. Where is our father? You know, Cedric Dankworth Smythe, the patriarch of the family. Didn't father send you a travel notice? He's gone to Transylvania to attend to urgent psychic butler business. He left quite suddenly and seemed rather distracted at the time. Really, Avalon? As I have just returned from Transylvania, completing the biannual, poorly formed vampire culling, it seems like I would have seen our father there. Perhaps you got your wires crossed. Maybe he made a side trip to Waverly Hills to visit some of the distant Dankworth Smite Cosms. Why don't you give them a call to see if he is still there? By the way, Armand, isn't it about time for you to be leaving? Well, Avalon, isn't it just possible that Father is in that rather large bag hanging from the oak tree yonder? You know, the one with the crocodiles beneath it and the various crossbows mounted around and about. Oh, and what is that uh, precariously balanced vat of hydrochloric acid doing out there? And the fact that it's writhing and that I occasionally hear... Muffled screams and such coming from it, is there just the slightest possibility that might be farther out in that bag? I mean, I know he enjoys that kind of thing, but it seems like this is getting a bit old. What do you say there, Avalon Lee? All right. All right. I admit it. I just couldn't take it anymore. Correct the gang of nerds. Make them look smarter than they really are. Smile, smile, and smile some more. Be proper. Curtsy when humans come around. Never eat any children or pets. It was just all too much. And now, here you are. You were always father's favorite. Now I'll probably be grounded for the foreseeable future. Why don't you just feed me to some hungry infernal creature? Well, as tempting as that might be, Avalon, I'm afraid you're going to have to stay in this world, at least for the time being. You see, I actually rescued Father hours ago. That's JJ out in the bag out there. He, uh, he needed a break. I think after everything he's been through, uh, residing, reposing, resting in a dark, quiet cloth bag is probably something he really is looking forward to. I'll give him a bit more time and then return him to his normal life. But what do we do with you? You know, there needs to be some punishment, Avalon. You can't simply imprison your father falsely and not expect anything to happen. What do you think we should do with a young lady, such as yourself, who's done what you've done? I need to know. Armand, can we please break to Dungeon Talk before I make punishment recommendations? And do you understand how cruel making me choose my own punishment is? Very well. Let's spend the next few minutes of the show on Dungeon Talk, as we call it. But as Sylvia cannot be held in any dungeon, this will just be Sylvia Talk. While while, while I were waiting on the other guys, uh, Sylvia, I'll... Uh... To, to piggyback on what J.J. was saying earlier, 
uh, there was a time that I was going to Belize, Central America. This mm-hmm. was way before it turned into a tourist attraction. Mm-hmm. And uh, we had a layover in Louisiana. So we all went down to the French quarters and everything. And, you know, as a young seminarian student, I was having a ball, you know, uh-huh. wild and crazy. And uh, <laughs> I found myself in the area that I should not have been. You know, we mm-hmm. were just wall. We were just walking around, and uh, all of a sudden, I was. The only way I can explain it, I was mentally, emotionally, and physically just sick. Mm. I mean, just all of a sudden. And then, as soon as I got out of that little area. I was fine again. Just this is in Belize? No, this was in Louisiana. It was in New oh, Orleans. Oh, okay. Yeah, New Orleans. New Orleans. You're probably oh. by one of those voodoo shops down by the French well, Quarter. No, that's exactly where <laughs> I was. Go, yeah. and, and I didn't know. And, 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 I, and when I figured out where I was, we were in front of all those voodoo shops, just like Vic said. But it affected me like just straight away. And yeah, that is, that's the first time. Now, I got some stories from Belize that I could tell you. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, one of the most astounding things I've ever saw was literally a witch doctor running around on all fours, foaming at the mouth, barking like a dog. Oh, my. Yeah, that's not that's the kind of thing I you see every day. No. <laughs> and I'm like, no. okay. Uh, so a, every horror story you see on the on the possessed, there's some truth to it. I've seen it, so it's it's don't, crazy. Don't, Father Bertrand, don't isn't possession just part of the voodoo religious ritual? Mm-hmm. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. I mean that's that's what it's. I mean they open themselves up to the orishas. Well, just like Sylvia said, she said a key word there: open up. Mm-hmm. And uh, if if you look at at ninety nine point nine percent of the voodoo practices, it all it all has to do with some kind of blood being shed. And when that blood is shed, it it is a mockery or 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 a notation toward covenant or mm-hmm. relationship. Mm. And so and so when they are slicing that that animal or human, whatever it be, through whatever kind of sacrifice they want to do, they are exposing blood to be a mockery on the very first thing that God himself did in the garden. Mm. You know, if you think about it, God gave the very first sacrifice through clothing Adam and Eve, right? Yeah. And so and so the same thing has to happen in the quote unquote demonic or voodoo ram. They are shedding that blood for a purpose of possessing or or oh. taking or taking up inhabitants or abiding somewhere. The thing about it is, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but even uh JJ, even 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 in the uh the Japanese religions, it all has to do with inhabiting something. Yes, it does. And, and and that's what we have to look at, whether it's a whether it's a ghost or whether it's demonic, whether it's whatever. These entities are wanting to inhabit a place, thing, or person. And somebody mm-hmm. somebody even mentioned animals earlier. Same difference. Someone said to me one time, well, 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 well can a demon enter an animal?" Well, hell yes, but excuse my language, but. <laughs> Of okay. course they can. <clears throat> they can inhabit anything they want to if they if they're given permission. Well, in in Japan, it's this concept of tachiyari, which is a mm-hmm. perverted sense of divine inhabitant, but twisted. Exactly. And it's yeah, it's never a good thing. But all I know is that you never ever want to piss off a boko or a priest. Mm. Out of that way, right. Now I ask you, have you ever heard a better paranormal rundown guest than Sylvia Schultz? I mean, the knowledge, the erudition, the humor, the outrageous courage. Sylvia Schultz, what a fine guest you were. The Paranormal Rundown is a joint production of Vicar Manson, 
Father Michael Birdsong, Dave Griffith, and J.J. Johnson. All music you heard was from Smart Sound during this episode, sometimes Lobo Loco. Please write to us at feedback at paranormalrundown.com. We use no media clips during this show, so I guess it doesn't really matter. What does matter is that Avalon Lee is now off doing her punishment. Ah, she's having a wonderful time. Good night, happy Halloween, and we'll see you in two weeks. Be there. Punishment for behavioral transgressions in the Dankworth Smythe family is swift, certain, and undeniably brutal. All right, back to work. Number 316,912. I will not imprison my father in a large bag, however clean, and hang said bag above starving crocodiles and 12.07 molarity hydrochloric acid. Number 316,913. I will not imprison my father in a large bag, however clean, and hang said bag above starving crocodiles and 12.07 molarity hydrochloric acid.